Let me just skip here. Hello. Hello. Welcome to my podcast. I'm your host, Larry Liu, and uh, today I'm delighted to be joined by Dennis Murphy, who is uh, uh, you, you're based currently in uh, Massachusetts still, right? Yep, but I will very shortly be starting a PhD program at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Well, congratulations on that. And um, thank you. So, so you, and you said you wanted to research about uh, you know elections and uh, you know basically how do you secure democracy uh, given that uh, you know technological. Uh, changes are happening certainly i mean social media of course plays a very big role in misinformation uh in during election season and um yeah is, is there any update to that uh, sort of research program uh, as far as you're concerned well it's a little bit early to make an update before i start but um the basic premise is still the same i'm very interested in trying to understand both the internal mechanisms and the external mechanisms behind democratic decay and democratic erosion, that's sometimes called uh, democratic resilience. So elections is part of that, technological advancement is part of that, um, what we call active measures or foreign influence operations is a part of that, as is parasitic processes online. It's a very large topic, which means that by the time I sit down to write it for a dissertation, it needs to be narrowed down for now, everything is important to me, and I'll sort out what's the most important thing later on. Yeah, so, uh, well, then we'll have to sort of pick apart certain elements uh, inside of it. Um, so, so, I mean, is for instance, like around this election season, I mean, 2020, um, I'm like so within a four year time span. I mean, I would you know from 2016, I would say that you know it certainly got on a lot more sophisticated. Perhaps there's much more uh, ability to use software to influence the uh, electoral process. Mm -hmm. But um, but I haven't heard an awful lot about it. I mean, I mean, does it have anything to do with the fact that perhaps you know the mainstream media? Um, is virulently anti-Trump, and then it's like, well, okay, he lost the election, so therefore, you know, we don't have to care that much about it. I mean, or or is there something objective about the 2020 elections, um, election interference compared to the, the prior election? Well, there are two competing things at war with each other, and I don't know which is stronger or if one is entirely unsubstantiated, and you hit it both. So for instance, there is interference that goes on. We received reports from different members of the intelligence community that have talked about foreign influence inside of our elections. This has been going on for a while. But at the same time, there is a strong vested interest in ensuring that the judgment of the 2020 election is that it is among the most secure that we've ever had. The more you bring up external factors that might undermine that, the greater instability you have with regards towards that election. We don't want to add any fuel to the fire that might cause things to go in a bad way. But personally, what I've seen, I don't know. I honestly can't tell you. I can only provide speculation. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 an Interesting. It's an important question. I think you know how do you, uh, you know, make elections as uh, you know secure as possible, um, you know, uh, going forward. Um, but I mean, I, I remember there was uh, this interview with Christoph Krebs, I believe was his name, and he was the election official, and I believe he was removed by uh, the Trump administration. But uh, but he said that, yeah, that it was a fairly uh, secure election and, and and it's very you know important to point out that that it was the previous president uh, Trump that basically put doubt into the uh, electoral process um, and um, and what I find very interesting is that you know there are two of his successes in other countries um, you know Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu 
who recently lost the premiership uh, because you know, there was like another coalition that basically formed together to depose him. Mm -hmm. um, uh, said, oh, well, there was must have been electoral fraud, even though his liquid party was the biggest uh, electoral bloc uh, in the election. Um, and now in Peru, you have uh, Keiko Fujimori. She's, she's the um, uh, lead candidate for, you could say, the right wing, you know, it's kind of like neoliberal authoritarian uh, political forces. Um, and she seems to narrowly lose the election now for the third time in a row. I mean, and what's very interesting is that each time when she got into the, the second runoff vote, she had like 49.6%, 49.8%. So it was really, really tight. Uh, and so it happened this time again, you know, where there's like a left-wing leader, Pedro Castillo, who uh, apparently won the election. But um, in each of these three cases now, I mean, basically you have the sore losers to say, oh, well, you know, this must have been voter fraud. Um, and I, I was I was wondering, I mean, do you have a commentary about this? I mean, is there sort of like an, you know, opportune, you know, anti-democratic uh, consensus that sort of is building up in, uh, uh, in a lot of, uh, you know, yeah, formally democratic countries? Well, there's a tension formally democratic. <laughs> there's a tension. Formally AAL -A at the end. Ah, okay. Formally. Okay. All right. So there's a tension between the desire to suggest that you are a true representative of the people, the electorate, and losing the election. This forces a populist into a bad way in that they could either say that they are either not representative of the people as they so claim, or that there was a problem with the election, i.e. that either their messaging was blocked or wasn't treated with equal respect on various media outlets, or that the process itself broke down and that there was in some way fraud. And this tension exists so long as the populist underlying message of representing the true people, the majority of the population continues. In a liberal democracy, no one claims that they are representative of the entire people or of the true people and that a failure to win an election means that that is a failure of the system. Instead, we go with the punches and if we lose an election, we try again next time. We change and adapt our message. The history of political parties has been like this since we've had democracy. Messaging adapts in the wake of a defeat. Talking points are taken, absorbed or transformed as a result of continual communications with the base, those politicians that remain in power because no party is ever destroyed completely and what comes about later on. So for instance, say you're in a presidential election and one guy wins the primary and he wins and then afterwards you're left with an option. Was a different guy in the primary the right way to go? Was there a problem with their messaging? Was there a problem with how they were trying to outreach? Very rarely, do you find people who say, is there a problem with the way the election is done? And lately, that has been a very common talking point, and it's been growing for a while. So since the early 2010s, there's been a small movement in the United States that has been pushing towards challenging the legitimacy of the election, i.e. Tea Party populists were very much a part of that vein early on, and that we've been slowly being pushing that more and more into the mainstream of what is now populist Republican politics. And until that goes away, I'm not sure what to do about that. And you can also see it to a much lesser extent on the left sometimes in that uh, there is a problem with the way that the Democratic primary was run so that Bernie Sanders was not president a couple of times. And we need to find a way to make that not really acceptable ways to approach politics and instead go back to the older way that things were done. Yeah, uh, and uh, so this this sort of like democratic backsliding as it's being described in the political science literature, I mean, as you say, it's been uh, going on for a while and I, 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 
I was wondering, I mean, how useful actually it is to go back to the ancient Greeks again, so to uh, <laughs> you know, to, to Aristotle and um, so in, so in his work and I, you know, of course, like the data that he was drawing on is his own, uh, you know, like ancient Greek, uh, you know, uh, area. And he sort of noted that, you know, once you start, you know, introducing a democratic system, um, you know, it can work quite well for a certain period of time, but then over time, you're going to have, you know, maybe, I don't know, some economic crisis or, you know, some, you know, I don't know, bad drought or some cataclysmic uh, shock to the system and, um, you know, or war. And uh, then you have this, you know, charismatic leader that comes in and uh, sort of says, you know, those other people, they're the enemies of the people, just vote for me, support me, and I'll protect you guys. Um, and then strangely, it works during these uh, troubled time periods. So then you have <laughs> democracy turning into tyranny. Um, and, uh, and then maybe later on, there would be a cycle to go back to uh, well functioning democratic system um yeah and then it's, it's another example i would think about is of course in western history you have um the transformation of the uh the roman republic into the the, the princeps which is uh, the the roman king uh mm -hmm. you know around augustus uh um and uh, where well, i guess the underlying idea was that you know the sort of somewhat democratic system you know with like senators and you know um uh you know uh, congress members um you know couldn't be sustained um so you know so you need a dictator sort of to hold everything together and to, uh, you know rule the empire um like do you think that there's such a thing as like you know I, I mean, like, are, are these historical patterns relevant to us today, I guess? In a way, yes, but we need to be very careful about how we deal with historical analogies or drawing parallels, because there are people that run away with it, and they'll say something along the lines of, we are experiencing a takeover of the Republic in the same way that one had in Athens or in the same way that one had inside of ancient Rome. And it's difficult to walk too much with that one because these were very different systems and very different societies. Athenian democracy, it has similarities to modern democracy, but it's very divorced. They had a very different way of doing things. And in Rome, it was even more bizarre. Uh, so for instance, you could take a look at how voting was done in the Roman Republic, and a lot of it would seem very strange to you. But at the same time, if you were to extrapolate lessons outside of this distant window into our own culture, our own civilization, our own political system, there are some things that can be learned. Uh, key among them is the incentive to create an anti-institutional rhetoric to use the people against the state and society. Uh, so for instance, weaponizing discontent. And this is something that you don't need to go back to the Greeks and the Athenians for. You can find examples of it in the early republics of the 18th and 19th century. A lot of republics die, very few maintain it, which is part of the reason why there's this very famous line given shortly after we made sure that we knew what type of system of government we had and it was what type of government will we have it is a republic if you can keep it and that is the that's the fundamental spirit behind trying to maintain a democracy it is balancing between different forces inside of it that could tear itself apart and we were torn apart once before uh, the american civil war is a very clear example and we came close a couple of times too uh, so, for instance, back during the Federalist and Democratic Republican disputes between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, not them personally, but the forces that they represented, New England almost became an independent country at one point. And that is something that not a lot of people know about, but it had to do with this damaging give and take and control over the political system. 
And then we also almost had something similar later on when it came down to defining what type of country we were going to be. And that one was a much weaker movement that happened in the late 1800s. Now we have something else entirely. We have a division that isn't so much geographic as it is urban and rural, as it is a divide in education, a divide in media, a divide in a common understanding of the legal system. And that is something relatively new. And I'm not entirely sure what to make of it. So if we take a look at, if we take a look at systems that change, we are in the midst of a system, a transition in the system, and we are still navigating the rules of the road that we're going to ultimately adopt into the future. And how much the past is relevant to making that clear? I don't know, because the fourth industrial revolution is a very different type of transition than we've had it ever before. We could look towards the industrial revolution. We could take a look at the age of political revolutions. Um, there's stuff to learn there. Uh, I, I have very strong sympathies as a, a sort of amateur historian, but I'm unsure how strong those lessons will be. Right. So you mentioned the term system change and fourth industrial revolution. So I think those are terms that, uh, you know, the audience might be interested in seeing some more description of, I mean, more unpacking of. Um, and so, I mean, essentially, so of course we know about the 2020 campaign of uh, Andrew Yang. He ran on a platform of universal basic income. And of course, a big premise behind that uh, uh, campaign was this, belief that uh, the political class wasn't acknowledging uh, that, uh, you know, fourth industrial revolution. Um, and, you know, the presumption that he made sort of is that, um, is that robots, artificial intelligence is getting better and better, and uh, it would uh, ultimately encroach on, you know, more human labor. Um, uh, to the point that, you know, technological unemployment would roll out as a sort of mass phenomenon. Um, and uh, so I recently read another book by uh, Daniel Zuskind. He's a fellow at uh, uh, Oxford University. And um, yeah, he had written a book with his father before, Richard Zuskind. He's a, a lawyer and uh, um, a big believer in uh, automating professional work. Mm -hmm. And I must have assumed that the son, who is an economist, uh, you know, some of these ideas must have rubbed intergenerationally. And um, yeah, so basically his argument is that, you know, so he, he argues that AI doesn't have to be human-like, which is sort of the original assumption. Like, you know, it has to, uh, the, the original assumption was um, that, you know, creativity innovation, you know, putting new ideas together, you know, uh, recognizing things, um, relationships, you know, all of the sort of like human cognitive skills that we have, um, you know, AI would have to replicate that in order to replace human beings. Uh, and, and Zoskin's argument is, no, it doesn't, you know, all, all that AI has to do is be as good or slightly better at specific tasks, which um, you know, which we humans would do in, in, in a workplace. And um, so if you, if you accept sort of like the, the lower threshold thesis, uh, I don't know whether he, I don't know what name he gave it, but uh, um, he, he basically then concludes that, you know, uh, a future without work is something that we uh, would seriously have to consider um, and uh, I, I read another one of his contributions recently. Uh, it was, I think, in, published in the Boston Review. So there was an article by uh, Darren Asamolo. He's one of the top labor economists in the field of automation, future of work. Um, and Zuskind wrote a reply. And he was really the most pessimistic, you could say, like, you know, the most gung-ho in terms of technological unemployment. Um, and uh, and all he was talking about in his reply is, 
you know, we, we've we've got to figure out how to do leisure leisure society. You know, mm-hmm. like form a society where the worth of a human being comes from basically being alive rather than contributing to the labor market. But um, I don't know. I, I I think we addressed this issue last time, but I don't know where he had any response to that uh, literature. So I'm most familiar with Darren Ashmoglu from his work on, say, Why Nations Fail with James Robinson. And he wrote a similar book with him that was a follow-up. The Narrow Corridor. Yeah. Yes. I, I read both of them, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm unfamiliar with his more, his non-book works. So uh, I wish I could speak more confidently on that. But on the idea of AI not necessarily needing to be human-like, that's something that I've done a little bit of cool research in. So there's this underlying principle in AI research about whether or not one will ever be able to generate artificial intelligence as in a general artificial intelligence. This is the concept of a self-learning AI that is able to learn from diverse subjects in a way that mimics human understanding. And of course, there's the underlying fear that this could rapidly spiral out of control. But general AI is something that people keep thinking is just a few years away and it keeps not happening. And some of that has to do with the nature of AI and what we consider general AI, the types of problems that we say can only be solved by a thinking type of algorithm. And that just keeps being pushed further and further out. There was a time when people thought that an AI would never be able to do chess. Then there was another time when they thought that AI would never be able to play Go. And then there was a time when they thought that AI would never really be able to understand the complexities of language if it wasn't able to mimic the human brain. Well, we've done chess now forever. That's old. We have AlphaGo that came out half a decade ago. And now we have GPT-3, which is a form of software that is mind-boggling in its implications that you can use to unlock certain core concepts beyond language. It's not 100% there, but it is very interesting how close it is. So when we're dealing with the space of whether or not we'll ever have a general AI that is really able to mimic the human brain, regardless of how much we build a lot of AI software on the idea of mimicking that through deep learning and other aspects of the structure or architecture of software engineering, we are then put into a place of Maybe we don't need that, because if we're able to solve all of the problems that we need with less sophisticated software, then you could do it, and you can do it on a more reasonable time frame, as in we are rapidly approaching a transition point where most forms of semi-routine labor can be done with only minimal oversight. Now, there's only... There's only so far you can take that because ultimately you don't want to create a black box system where you don't really understand what's going on with the AI processes. Uh, That's just a recipe for disaster and misallocation. But we are getting very close to something that makes a lot of the work that we used to do seem strangely unneeded or unnecessary. So then that leads to a transition of How do we reimagine human life and human labor in an economy where it is increasingly unnecessary? And it's funny to say that given how many jobs wanted signs are out there now. So there's been an interesting shift in the labor force dynamic in the COVID-19 pandemic drawdown. Um, So for instance, I was just in a Walmart where they were offering almost $20 an hour to people who wanted to join and they can't find people who want to do it. So we're in an interesting spot right now because we're in a transition, but what it's transitioning into, I'm not sure. Maybe we will make it to that idea that we won't need this anymore. Maybe, maybe not. Probably just on the point of the labor shortage. I mean, 
uh, it, it's evidently undivorceable from the pandemic because you know if that had not happened you know like if you could say because you know what happened in the early months of the pandemic when the lockdown occurred was that uh, you know a lot of jobs were being uh, cut back on and um, you know it seems to be that now that because there's also a lot of savings that people have I mean there were three stimulus packages there were um, you know there's a lot of extra unemployment benefit money so um, so people have this, you know, purchasing power and, you know, now that people are getting vaccinated, so everything is coming back up again. So mm-hmm. basically a lot of cash in the savings account um, and businesses just slowly opening up. So in that mismatch, you're going to see also inflation inev- inevitably. Um, and so I, I I don't know how long term that kind of thing is. And also you have to consider that it's probably during a period of a labor shortage that um, where, you know, there's a very strong upward wage pressure, which we haven't seen in a long time, that actually, um, you know, investment in automation would become more worthwhile to make. Um, I was thinking of another argument um, by uh, Aaron Bernanoff, and I read his uh, book as well on the automation future of work. And um, so he sort of looks at it from a, you could say, neo-Marxist perspective. But um, but so he, I mean, he essentially argues that you know um, that you know rather than accelerating automation, has been slowing down based on um, the the lack of growth in labor productivity, and um, and he says that the labor productivity stagnation comes from output stagnation. So, um, yeah, I mean, if you look at like mainstream economists like Larry Summers who talks about secular stagnation, he's been saying the same thing now for at least a decade now since the Great Recession. Um, and then of course, the you could say orthodox Marxist economists have been sort of uh, on the stagnation, this monopoly capitalism thesis for you know basically the last five decades, really. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but if there's evidence for e- economic stagnation, uh, then this would be disincentive for investments, um, and then less investment also means you know less automation, less productivity growth, um, and um, a- a- and so and then the other thing is that you know even if automation would throw people out of the labor force. Um, not everybody's going to leave that labor force. Well, some will, but um, but others will just stay in, and they'll, you know, just compete for the you know low wage jobs. Um, you know, even the new ones that 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 we created, like you know the Instacart and Amazon Flex and uh, you know warehouse work, you know things like that. Um, so. I don't know, but but, I, but you see, the, the timeline here, I think, is very important, right? So are we talking about so what I just mentioned? Is that just a blip, like a short-term phenomenon? Like within the next few years, we'll resolve that with the end of the pandemic. Um, you know, um, or, or is this like a long-term structural trend where we basically, uh, we could be kept as... Yeah, you know, as you know, you could say wage slaves into 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 perpetuity, right? Well, there's a careful line between what is your what is a wage slave and what is just someone who's gainfully employed. So, so uh, yeah, when I think about this, I don't know to what extent it's short term. Whether or not it will be short term will ultimately depend on two things. I think. The first is whether or not automation is running into unexpected expense. Uh, So for instance, we don't necessarily know what's going on in the background of Amazon when they're taking on these robots. We have optimal operating costs, but maybe as they've been brought forward, it hasn't actually been as much as they thought it would be. And then there's also the hidden costs of potential legislation. It's not uncommon for companies like this to fear that there will be some form of regulation to mandate a certain amount of employment for it. 
i.e. if Amazon suddenly has no employees or no employees that are actually in the local basis for say their headquarters that aren't just upper level management, you could see added pressure in the local community. So they might be trying to forestall that type of hidden pressure by hiring more people. But the second one is demographics. How many young people or how many employable people are in that space? So for instance, one thing that we've been seeing is an increasing trend towards people buying out of the labor market. So for instance, we had a peak, I forget when, I think it was in the 1990s, but since then we've had steady declines in labor force participation. Uh, there are a lot of factors that are going into that one, but COVID-19 saw a massive drop in the number of people that are in the employment market. This is definitely something that's contributing towards long-term or at the very least witnessable wage growth because it needs to at least go beyond the most immediate term for that to have an effect on prices because of the stickiness and elasticity curves and blah, 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 blah. Uh, but going forward with that, it could be very interesting to see whether or not a overall reduction in fertility rates, an overall rise in expectation about what is considered acceptable forms of gainful employment will result in an overall transition whereby companies will actually need employees that they just don't have. We saw something very similar to this back when we were talking about farmers, I think a year or two ago now, when you uh, first had me on, uh, where there was migrant labor that were working in farms. There was a general transition where uh, most native born people that were interested in that weren't being employed in these areas. And there was no real desire to see that. There were large companies that begged for people to come and they never came. Well, now you might find a similar transition going on inside of some very low end, repetitive, soul sucking types of work in the service sector. And you might see a transition outward from there as well. So who knows? It could be. Maybe not, but it could be. Right. So, I mean, like with farm labor, I mean, it's very clear that. Um you know, native, you know, uh, born people uh, have no interest in these kinds of jobs. And, um, uh, and, and that would suggest, yeah, that, I mean, if you look at the H2A visa program, I mean, uh, which is for farm workers, um, I believe that something like 300,000 individuals or more uh, being brought in on an annual basis um, to do this, um, really essential work uh, as we know now know uh yeah i was reading this article yesterday about um um you know the bullshit job phenomenon which you know as some people might know it's basically the the presence of jobs that don't really add value to the economy but they still get produced in large numbers and the fact that the pandemic and the lockdown really made this so explicit right so before the pandemic you know you like a job is a job you know if you if you work a job it must mean it's useful right somebody decided to pay you a salary which means you must have delivered a marginal product is the economics lingo right mm -hmm. and um and then with the lockdown now we, all of a sudden we said hey if you're an essential worker just continue showing up you know like you're a cop you're uh, doctor, nurse, obviously, during the height of COVID. Um, if you are a delivery worker, warehouse worker, you know, uh, supermarket. Um, but everybody else, you are, we'll call you non-essential worker. And uh, there's one of two things that happens. I mean, either you get, you know, laid off or furloughed, um, or you belong to the privileged white collar class, which means that you get to uh, do work from home. Uh, and um, yeah, so I, I I thought this was superbly interesting. And then because because then you can and, and actually, you know, like the, the, the governors in the various states, I mean, they did have a list of set occupations where it's like you are essential, you're non-essential. And 
it'd be really interesting to take a look at the list and then just just calculate like what percentage of the workforce is considered to be essential and you know i i wouldn't be too surprised if it's i would say it would be less than half of the total right um and um yeah and i and i think that that sort of gives you an indication about like like even orthogonal to this automation argument you know whether it makes sense or not to discuss the future of a, you know or shaping a leisure society you know um I, I i would say it's i i think there would be the evidence that you know that we need to to argue for for more leisure activities because you know because i mean at the end of the day i mean it's about like so if if we don't need a whole lot of people in essential work you know then you're going to have this opportunity cost you could say between okay you know you work uh you know basically a useless job but you get paid a salary and you get to you know pat yourself in the back that you know you're weirdly contributing to the community um or you know you basically go out and you you select your own leisure activity i mean the, the things that you think give you the most meaning and um uh so in in my view i think as time goes on i think that you know you what you might call like leisure coordinators i think would play a much bigger role i mean and i would say certainly i mean you know the podcasters like you know myself and you participate or um you know education you know, any kind of educational platform you know um you know entertainment you know comedians stand up comedy you know things like that um sports athletics um i i think that should play an increasing role uh and it, i think it should be subsidized publicly um mm. that's an interesting thought so one thing that I have noticed is that there has been a massive uptick in entertainment like spending or times that people spend doing things that are visual entertainment, at least during the pandemic. So Netflix numbers, Disney Plus numbers, they saw market increases, time spent on them, time spent on YouTube has definitely seen a dramatic increase. It will be interesting for me to see whether or not those are stable. So for instance, as people have the go back to work or as people go back outside to public parks and zoos whether or not that will stick around and sure um, i think a lot of people would like comedians to be back open uh, to go to a stage to go to a live concert maybe music i'm sure that those things are definitely in the wings ready to come back the interesting thing about the essential non-essential labor quandary was that the essential labor was those people whose existence was necessary for people to be able to survive so your plumbers your policemen your firefighters your people who were selling you food for instance and what you saw was a dramatic decrease in the overall importance of others and I would be out of sorts, not to mention doctors in the essential labor category as well. So you had this stark divide between those that were necessary for people to survive and those that were unnecessary, or at the very least, not necessary right now. When you pull apart that category, I'm unsure how much of that was useless labor or labor that was done for the sake of itself and how much of that was labor that is needed or necessary but just couldn't be justifiable in a pandemic because there was a difference between uh, you really weren't adding anything you were just trying to find a way to spend money because in the nature of budgets if you don't spend every single dime that you've had this year then you might see a budget decrease next year that's a pretty common problem in a lot of organizations. So what is the breakdown there? 
I think you'll probably find that more of them are perhaps unnecessary than in the necessary category, if only because of a definition in terms. But I'm curious to see just how much of it really would be unnecessary labor. It might not be as much as you think. Yeah, okay. So a part of the non-essential worker category, so if you're really specific, like like a restaurant worker, like a bartender, I, I would say that, you know, it's def that that's not useless. It's definitely a useful job. Um, mm -hmm. but it was sort of locked down during the pandemic. So because you know the the, the health risk of uh, meeting people face to face. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I, right. So I, I don't want to go out of my way, make a blanket statement here that, okay, well, all non-essential equals BS. I think that's, that's too much, but uh, yeah. And I, I, I think certain job categories are going to come back um, mm -hmm. and uh, they are definitely, you know, like in the case of the bartenders, uh, they, you know, add to, you know, social well-being, right? Because it's only if you go to a public space where you're being served food and drinks and people can be merry, people can be happy, so to speak, right? Um, so some of that coming back is good. Um, but, but then I saw I saw this lecture recently by uh, by David Autor. He's another one of these big labor economists. And, um, you know, he made this actually very pessimistic prediction for urban city workers um in the you could say leisure hospitality sector um mm -hmm. because because if okay so of, of course so the, the reason why you know uh inner city urban areas is um very much flourishing is because of the you could say the managerial elite the professional class you know the you know, yeah, higher education, uh, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera, technology, companies, finance. Um, and now the thing is that if they're transferring more and more of the work uh, from the inner city office to a uh, home office, essentially, mm -hmm. um, then something very interesting could happen. So, you know, if they say, so if they, if most of them should just shift to a hybrid model, you know, I think, They'll still rent office spaces, but it will probably be less, right? Um, but uh, you could see how the downtown area is going to lose out completely. I mean, you know, the parking lot attendants, the uh, the hairdressers, uh, the the restaurants, the bar scene. You know, all all of these workers. I mean, your transportation, you know, public transportation, etc. Now, I mean, does it just mean like the purchasing power just gets shifted, you know, to the home communities of the of the work from home work office workers? Uh, maybe there's a little bit of demand increase there, but but well, you could also argue that you know that, that there will be a total decline in jobs, uh, especially for um, yeah these these you know lower skilled workers in urban areas uh, and. That could be, you see, so I, th I think Otto described this as a form of automation. Like, I mean, it's, it's not directly, so it's not like a robot and the software coming and taking mm -hmm. the job. It, it, it's that, you know, if the, if the work from home office workers, if they said, hey, Zoom and Slack and, you know, Google Hangout and those services uh, allow me to do my work, um, and then thereby, I wouldn't have to commute into the city and spend money on food and entertainment and other things uh, over there. Um, you know, is, or like another stupid example is like, let's say, so if you go to the office, you know, you have to wear a suit and stuff. So, you know, if you do work from home, you know, so you're not wearing the suit. So it means also you're not going to the dry cleaner anymore, right? Um, so I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's an indirect form of, of automation, but it would still be classified as such uh, in, in author's view. Um, and, and that, that would be an interesting transformation of the, uh, of the labor market. Um, you know, and of course you could argue that the inequality would increase because presumably the, work from home office workers, I mean, if they get to keep their jobs, you know, they're, 
uh, you know, purchasing power is strong and stuff, but. There's a very similar parallel there between the idea of outsourcing jobs overseas. So for instance, the exodus of high skilled labor and high wages from cities to outside of the city could have a pretty massive impact on the viability of a lot of jobs and networks down there. So for instance, it's one of those strange things, but the existence of high wages inside of a local area, even if it's not evenly distributed, does have a notable positive impact on overall economic activity. So even if it's perhaps not the healthiest thing for society, having a few billionaires in your local area is net positive for total amount of economic productivity, even if it would be better if there was more redistributive models that were at play. When you see the pull away of that type of labor, you might see two interesting things. First, you'll probably find that it's much cheaper to rent office space. Uh, so for instance, um, the middle class might see a notable benefit, although middle class usually isn't really doing that office space. Maybe the lower part of the 1% and the 2 and 3% might be doing the office space. But for areas outside of that, if there isn't a net substitution whereby new people move in to fulfill similar roles, then you might find an overall expansion in areas that are associated with the urban poor. And I think that that might have some negative effects. Now, you might have some people that inside of the urban poor are now because of the overall decrease in prices are able to leave. But the only thing that that does is that it even makes that urban poor even poorer. Uh, so for instance, brain drain doesn't actually necessarily result in any local economic benefit. It, it has the exact opposite effect. So that's actually something very curious. Uh, it, it, made me, it made me think of a stupid short story I wrote like almost 10 years ago now. Uh, called the end of cities, uh, when I thought that there'd be no need for anyone to go there. But there's also a counter argument uh, that I've learned since then. You've lost the economy of scale aspect. You've lost the Pareto efficiency. So when a lot of people were piled on top of each other, the money was oriented in a way so as to make it maximally profitable in a local area. But if you have fewer resources dedicated to that elsewhere, you might need more money to generate similar levels of productivity. So if we're assuming no loss in total value given to these workers, just their location, you could have a less Pareto efficient outcome inside of uh, suburban areas or smaller cities. And this would actually result in a net overall increase in expenditures. Because what might of lower productivity? Yeah, yeah, uh, like a lower productivity curve. Uh, so, um, yeah, I guess it's like what happens if you take your most efficient assembly line and you cut it into ten pieces and put it everywhere, but you still expect it to produce the same amount of stuff. You would need to put more input in order to get the same output, because that's just the nature of consolidation inside of um, your productivity curves. So that would be. That'd be curious. For instance, that might actually be an argument in reverse. So there might be more money being spent elsewhere. They might need to have increased time in order to make it work properly. And then you have a overall more positive effect elsewhere because those laborers inside of the more rural areas become the high spenders in that community. As in, they become more likely to patronize an entirely different type of dynamic inside of their local areas instead of the keeping up with the Joneses aspect of urban city life where everyone tries to get a Gucci, you might have an entirely different type of phenomenon inside of a local suburb. So I'm not, I'm not sure what that would look like in the long run, because of course you could always make the argument of automation and then cutting people out, but it, it's cool. It has a lot of different implications. Yeah, and um, but I think you know the point that you touched on. I mean, urban economies of scale. I think it's important because um, that's certainly what a lot of big cities are using as an argument to say that 
you know, as soon as the economy starts to open up again, um, you know, their main assumption and their main hope essentially is that um, is that people get fed up about uh, you know hybrid and you know work from home and uh, and they recognize the uh, intrinsic advantages to uh, returning back to the uh, office and um, yeah, I mean it's it, because it's definitely true that like it's only like when you meet people when you have ever met people face to face you know that's when you you know kind of start liking them you want to collaborate with them you want to be business partners with them et cetera et cetera so um and uh and that would give a prime advantage to um to being physically in the same location and so this could be very much the potential i mean and so far i mean Pre-pandemic, I mean, this has definitely been the case where, you know, there are like some thriving cities in the South, like I think like in Austin, Texas um, would be one of them, um, Phoenix, Arizona, and then there's, you know, and of course, you know, the Bay Area, San Francisco, I mean, they keep on sucking up more capital. So, um, you know, I, I think the overarching economic logic uh, over the long term is still that you know, it's it's you know, I guess agglomeration effect is is the way how it's described in the urban economic literature, right? Um, mm-hmm. Where it's just advantageous if you put a lot of people together, um, because I mean the idea is also that, like, it, it's not that you know you're tied to a single employer, uh, right? I mean, you could be poached by the next employer who's like the office like is just one block away right um and yeah th- th- that would suggest that you know that we could be very bullish about cities uh, that they could come back again and yeah i mean in, in that case yeah the you know then urban decline wouldn't be uh such a big deal but yeah i mean yeah we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll have to see how this this will uh shake out Uh Yeah. So picking up on a couple of threads that you said there, um, there is definitely a benefit to being face to face, but I also think that there's an added benefit of working to home that will likely outweigh that for a lot of people. So for instance, when you talk about, say, um, the Bay Area or LA and California, those are very long commutes. So if you say you are upper middle class for that area, or even just middle class, and you need to get where you need to go on a car, or lower class, well, working class, and you need to work on a long train commute in order to get to where you want to go. That's sometimes an hour to two hours of your day, just sitting, waiting to be somewhere else. And that could be that could be something that a lot of people will not be comfortable with the trade off for. Uh, Probably the biggest case study of whether or not this is going to happen won't be in the South, because the South is seeing a lot of net immigration, too. So, for instance, Florida, Georgia, Texas, there's a lot of people moving there. And California keeps losing people to net outward migration, but the urbanization doesn't seem to be stopping. There's still a housing shortage there. So it'll be very interesting instead to take a look at urban environments in the north. And the area that I'm most interested in seeing is New York City. So New York City saw a lot of their local industries uh, close. And it's questionable to see how quick of a recovery, if they will have a full recovery, will be. So it'll be interesting for me to see whether or not New York City is able to regain everything that it lost. I think that would be a pretty cool case study to look at because it's it's perhaps one of the most famous and influential cities inside of the United States. So if the pandemic put a decent enough dent into it that it might not go entirely back to the way that it was, I think that's something well worth exploring and entertaining. And a second thing to go along with that. Oh, you were gonna say something? Yeah, it was this book by, I think, 
Daniel Holtzman, I think was his name, but it, but it was the book was about neoliberalism in New York City, mm-hmm. and uh, so you know he he describes in the book, um, you know how New York City dealt with the fiscal crisis of uh, I would say to the 1970s around that time. Um, because there were, I mean, it, it wasn't the only city that was impacted. I think there was a, a shock that went through the entire, you know, urban American landscape, um, where I think there, it was a Nixon administration. So, f- so first under the uh, Lyndon Johnson administration, there was a massive increase in uh, spending for municipal governments, um, you know, like housing, urban development. There was a lot of, uh, you know, grant-based programs. Um, and Nixon was sort of the first guy who sort of cut back on those programs, uh, and they were slashed further under uh, under Reagan. Um, and um, yeah, and that, that coincided with like the move to deindustrialize uh, cities, and New York City was also impacted by that. Um, and then so in an area, and then and then white flight. That's the third variable, right? So you have people, you know, white middle class who had money, and they basically went to the outlying suburbs, um, you know, and, you know, took the money with them. Um, and so in this sort of like economic crunch that was sort of hitting New York City, uh, he described the sort of ideological transformation from, you know, you could say, you know, the government is there to help you uh, to uh, to this neoliberal mindset, which is uh, basically the private sector is provides the, the necessary goods, you know, like the maintenance of public parks, the maintenance of the metropolitan uh, transit authority, um, you know, the um, squatting was a big thing, so of, of housing, which were sort of abandoned because of the white flight. Um, and um, Right, so then, so then the overarching ideology is, uh, yeah, private sector takes care of everything, and and I was wondering, I mean, like that sort of ideological strain in, you know, has 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 not really disappeared, right? I think that, you know, um, it, it's sort of become sort of like an accepted way of, uh, you know, of, of organizing, you know, city services. Um, and um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, like, if you listen to like the Blasio, I mean, like, you know, he, the current mayor, I mean, he, you know, he sort of takes like a classic left-wing rhetoric. Um, but, um, but, but still, I mean, I would still say that the neoliberal legacy is still there, right? I mean, this belief in, oh, we, you know, we need to have the private sector to to provide people with all the things that they need. Well, um, I'll actually push back on this one a little bit because from my position, I've seen increasing distrust and dislike of private sector solutions in urban environments almost everywhere Uh, so new york city is a very democratic city which means that you're never going to get a republican mayor of the area which means that your choices are going to be between uh, moderate democrat and less moderate democrat and the moderate democrat will be more centrist will have more pro-market orientation, but the overall debate has been shifting further and further away from that, near as far as I can tell. I see growing mistrust of market-oriented solutions inside of the modern Democratic Party, and especially so inside of the modern urban environment. Now, that doesn't mean that there's a complete abandonment of the idea that there should be an incorporation of the free market or an incorporation of private sector forces, unless you're advocating for a complete nationalization or a de-emphasis of those forces entirely inside of a society in the realm of needs, which you might be. Um, I don't think so, but you might be. Um, 
I, I'm not unsure how you would ever get away from that. So New York City has Wall Street in it. And New York City has various forms of very prominent private firms. I think it's unlikely that you'll find a leader of New York City saying something along the lines of, we need to abolish private sector forces inside of our city to completely rework it somewhere else. And I'm, uh, that that's not what you're saying, though. Um, but you would find that rhetoric there. You would f definitely find it in a rhetoric that would appeal to market forces, because even in a mixed economy, even in a very social democratic mixed economy, there's going to be a very strong role for private sector forces. And I'm unsure how you can get around that as a fundamental problem. So you're always going to hear that rhetoric. But overall, though, I've heard far more hostility and skepticism towards a forces of private enterprise for public goods. As in, have you seen any noticeable increase or anything that's the same as it was since the 1970s? I mean, maybe, maybe I'm just not looking in the right places. Yeah, but just on this point about, you know, uh, why would it be privatization backlash? I think that, um, you know, so the, the Karl Polanyi theorem, you know, of uh, the uh, decommodification and double movement, I, I think that covers it really well, right? Where the idea is essentially that your know, markets are socially destabilizing because, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, markets can be a good thing, like if you have something to sell, right? So, I mean, if you, if you, you know, have a patent on like, you know, amazing sneakers that, uh, you know, are very lightweight and uh, easy to put on and stuff. And, uh, and you sell millions of your sneakers, which makes you, uh, you know, a millionaire or even billionaire. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's great. That, that, that's what markets are good for. But then, um, but say, you know, if you, if you don't really, if you can't really sell much, I mean, if you have a disability, you know, physically or mentally or uh, some kind of impairment uh, or you have to take care of family members so you can't really contribute much time to the labor market, you know, things, whatever circumstances in your life that uh, uh, would make you um, in high demand. Um, that would yeah, it would that would basically not be as good for you, right? So, um, and so the extent to which you could basically move back to decommodify somewhat, you know, by basically, you know, government taxing the people who have money and uh, giving it to uh, those who don't have much. Um, yeah, I think that that that's how you'd have to balance things out now. That kind of discussion, I think, is much easier to make um, somewhat at the state level, but especially at the federal level, because, you know, the federal government has, uh, how should I say, the least budget constraint because they mint the currency, you know, they can just print yes. money or they borrow money and things like that. Um, like, I would think, like, if I was running as mayor of, let's say, New York City, um, as it's currently happening now, um, I would say that, there, there's going to be substantial constraints as to, you know, how much of this like tax and redistribution you can do because, I mean, there was this interview recently with Andrew Yang, who's now running for mayor, uh, in New York City, and and he made exactly that distinction, like the, um, you know, because he said like if he was the president, he could basically, for instance, force companies to, um, you know basically pay a uniform federal tax rate on, you know, for instance, where they set up the, you know, their industry, their, their office, the factory space. Uh, but if you're just a mayor where you basically, you know, if you remember the HQ debate in uh, Amazon, right? Um, yes. Where like, if you're like the mayor or the governor, you go to Jeff Bezos you know, and you kiss his feet. Right, you're like, come on, you know, like I'll give you this money. You don't pay taxes ten years, whatever, and um, and and make sure that you know, give us the fifty thousand uh, office jobs, right? Um, and that, that that's what you just have to do. I mean, if I was a mayor, I would do the same thing because 
because I, I have no control over the other cities, you know, the other municipalities that is also trying to attract HQ2. Um, so, and that, that that's actually very depressing. I mean, that's why I, I don't know that the, the lack of freedom, the lack of flexibility is if you are a municipal leader, I think um, that makes it really tough to, I mean, because like, there's low hanging fruits, obviously, that you have as a mayor, which is, I think, on social issues, you know, like LGBT, abortion, you know, all these um, social identity issues. I would say that those are low hanging fruits because the city is already mostly progressive on, on those uh, on those areas. But, you know, the bread and butter issues that people care about, you know, like jobs, taxes, you know, um, I I I think it's really tough to be to be on the left, really. Uh, so, know. the urban problem of not being able to influence broader politics is definitely a thing. Um, although the state level is perhaps almost just as important. So, for instance, state tax rates don't change because a mayor wants something to happen, which is part of the reason why you see a lot of migratory flight out of, say, California towards Texas or towards Arizona, uh, basically a business investment and business opportunities. So uh, San Francisco could say that they have, uh, they are willing to kiss the feet of whatever big megacorp goes nearby. But we also need to take into mind that not everything is Jeff Bezos. Not everything is Bill Gates. Not everything is Larry Page. And one of the things that we find is that tax rates inside of cities are higher than outside of cities, as in this force that we are noting has not been so strong so as to unsettle the dynamic between urban and rural areas on effective taxation rates. Um, and this effective taxation debate is made even more salient by the fact that you do have an economy of scale inside of an urban environment so as to provide services more effectively and more uniformly. Uh, so I, I understand the point. I'm just unsure I find it as important necessarily. That's something that could very easily be said by Andrew Yang because he's running for a local office and he will inevitably bash heads with Joe Biden and Governor Cuomo, as in that's something that's inevitable. But overall, though, I don't see that type of rhetoric going too, too far down that line of actual policy results. So I know in Boston, the tax rate is higher. I, I know in New York City, the tax rate is higher than inside of the rural countryside, basically. Uh, taxes inside of New York City is very different from taxes in Buffalo or taxes in Rochester, New York, for instance. So I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't know how big of a deal that is. I wonder what their cutoff is or if they just decide to tax more poor people to make sure that the rich pay less. And if that's the model that they're going for, which again, I don't think that they're doing, um, I, I, don't know, I don't know how to make sense of that. Like I understand the point completely, I just don't know how that ratios out with everything else. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, obviously you're basically saying that this whole like you know, tax competition argument about, you know, like, isn't that useful of a model because, because, you know, because basically, like, you know, if, if you're like an investor, like a businessman, right, um, and you try to locate your business somewhere, so you have to decide to where I'm going to open up factory or office space. Um, and I would say tax is only one variable out of probably 50 or 100, right, um, mm -hmm. to consider. So, I mean, you might also consider human capital, right? I mean, the idea, like, if you, like, it makes sense to instance, yeah, Boston in your area, I mean, you know, Boston University, Harvard, MIT, I mean, you've got basically the best <laughs> universities in the country. And so, you know, so you, I would think, yeah, there's substantial amounts of human capital that's available there. And I think that would be, one consideration, especially if, like for uh, jobs that rec that do require um, significant human capital, like you know, like technology companies, for instance. 
So, um, yeah, so I, I, right. So I think that, yeah, there's a lot of factors that, that investors are using to, uh, to make investments. Um, yeah, taxes, they, they, I don't know, I mean, like, I mean, economists say, well, they do matter at the margins. So, um, so there was this paper by Asimolu, uh, uh, and, and he talks about like this phenomenon of excessive automation. So you can already tell that normatively he's, uh, he's against too much automation because, um, yeah, because of the trade-off with like less employment. Um, and he says that, you know, well, if you spend too much money on, so because it, so the tax policy is favoring capital and it is burdening labor, right? So because if you if you hire a worker, you know, um, you know, so so the worker gets taxed. So of course the employee has to take that into account, like for um, you know, um, and also the fact that. Social Security contributions, which is you know half employer, half employee, um, so that's that's the whole cost, the whole wage bill that you have to consider. And while capital investments, you know, machinery, technology, etc., um, I feel like there's a tax write-off. I would say, right? Um, you know, like depreciation of capital and things like that. And um, and then there's like R and D tax credits, right? So it's like basically supporting companies to invest in automation. Um, yeah, and then just like you know, Asimola basically says, well, you know, like like he's he's not like anti capital anti capital investments. I think you know, but he just wants to have it more balanced, such that you know. Such that employers are actually incentivized to uh, to invest in human capital and, and labor, because um, it's also like only if you have like labor investments inside, you know, this you know, labor market society, right? That that you can have like equitable, more equitable distribution of income, so to speak, um, and. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, so it's 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 an interesting argument. I mean, I've talked with another labor economist about it, and he says, you know, the taxes are not the only factor to consider. I mean, um, because you could also argue that, you know, like countries like Germany, for instance, uh, where you know this, you know, high taxes on on labor, you know, because you know they have a more generous welfare state, and. Um, you know they have a much bigger you know manufacturing employment share you know like they they keep their industrial jobs they also have a lot of automation too right mm -hmm. uh which means that i mean what that essentially means is like that they they they're dominating you know the segment of the global manufacturing market you know like the you know whatever the the mercedes and the bmws and so forth um yeah, I, I I I don't know whether for all countries you can make that uh, statement, but uh, but yeah, I mean, but but on your point, yeah, like I think taxes are definitely only one variable to look at uh, when making investment decisions. Okay. Another thing that was discussed a little bit earlier was the idea of commodifying or treating as a market problem things related to accessibility or minority functions. So for instance, say you're blind, what free market resources is going to be around to take care of your needs? Um, I think that invokes the idea of conscious capitalism. Uh, have you heard of that before? Is it about philanthropy? I mean, can you say a little more about it? No, no, no. It's not. It's not paternal capitalism. Um, it is this idea that there are companies and corporations that start up with a specific purpose in mind. Uh, perhaps the most overt example of this is 
black conscious capitalism, i.e. supporting local black business owners and having a local community centered around that and having community oriented results towards obtaining certain net positive local goods inside of the environment. Uh, you could think of it as a non-corporate response to capitalism that fits within the framework of a market-oriented solution, but is uh, more specifically guided by more than simple, say, uh, profit motive. So if you're blind, you could have companies that are catered towards making sure that there's increased accessibility for blind users or blind interfaces. So like voice recognition software, use of audiobooks over ordinary, not ordinary, over written books, uh, various forms of care, various forms of uh, community or unionized groups that are catering towards people who are blind, uh, blind or nearsighted or hard of seeing, I suppose. And then there's uh, the deaf and hard of hearing community as well. And you find that when people have a shared uh, shared disability or a shared uh, identity, uh, people tend to congregate into communities. So for instance, it's uh, rare to find people who are just, say, alone in the attic, your um, one deaf cousin who doesn't go out into the workforce and has everything taken care of by the family. No, instead you'd find that uh, this person who was deaf would instead go to uh, one of the uh, institutions or high schools or K through 12 systems that cater to and develop the deaf and hard of hearing community. And there's a reason why I'm bringing up this example explicitly. It's because I have a friend who has a startup inside of this area and I tried to help her out a little bit a little while ago and trying to make something up and running. And there's real demand there and there's real spending power there and there's the ancillary effect of people who are related to that so uh, support for various form of conscious capitalist community might be the friends and relatives of someone who has either a disability or the in-laws or broader community of someone who's inside of a um, ethnic oriented community the idea is that identity and identity oriented demand can result in identity-oriented solution inside of a market-type-based enterprise. Uh, so for instance, conscious capitalism is this idea that the free market can provide if there are producers inclined to act in a certain way in a community that generates demand for it. Uh, think of it like a networked effect for capitalism that is geared towards following one specific vector of identity. And thus far, it seems to have some effects, and it has some pretty powerful patrons too. So conscious capitalism was coined by Whole Foods as CEO. Um, and it has a lot of, I don't want to use trickle down effects, but it has a lot of competitors and a lot of followers in that type of vein. And it's not impossible, right? And I'm sure there are pretty easy ways to think of this in a way that wouldn't exactly seem as strange to people's ears. Uh, so for instance, uh, like a local Chinatown that's centered around providing business opportunities for people inside of a Chinese immigrant community or second and third generation Chinese people inside of the United States uh, that would have to do with specialty food shops, specialty cultural shops, specialty boutiques, I suppose, that create a community orientation that allows for the influx of capitalism and the commoditization of capitalist forces for the benefit of a local community. And I think that that has potential. Uh, so it's unclear to me that that type of approach would be better or worse than a federally mandated approach to try to public uh, to decommodify something and make it a public good without the necessary linkages towards the, say, demand that is originating from the community itself. So for instance, we have inside of the US government, uh, the American Disab with Disabilities Act, we have various forms of laws for anti-discrimination. And 
there's a limit to how far that can go without handing it off to a community to try to, to a certain extent, identify their own problems and put forward their own tentative solutions towards it for outside support. Um, when the faceless bureaucracy is telling you what the problem is and how to fix it, that could have uh, potentially unwanted implications or unwanted results inside of the community that it's aiming to protect. So yeah, uh, conscious capitalism seems to be something interesting and worth looking at, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, so within the left, I mean, who sort of wants to have a much more statist approach, uh, but there's there, there's still another suggestion that they have, which I find very interesting, um, which has this sort of like local, you know, localist involvement uh, ideology embedded, which is uh, participatory budgeting. And I think there's... Um, I think in Sao Paulo, I think it's definitely a Brazilian city where they tried that, where, um, you know, so when the municipality would draw up the budget, you know, you could say 99% of the budget is sort of, you know, written by, you know, the city officials, the city government, mm -hmm. you know, for, you know, whatever core functions that they define. But then just 1% of that budget, uh, you would basically... Um, do like a series of like local community gatherings, you know, like public uh, hearings, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, you invite the community to come in and uh, uh, and then, you know, they could sort of vote on that, you know, how to spend that 1% uh, of the, of the money. And, uh, and it's very interesting because, you know, Andrew Yang, when he ran for president, he took up mm -hmm. that same idea um, for the federal budget where he said, you know, let's reserve 1% of all the federal spending and people would then decide, um, presumably like in, in writing, they would send uh, their request to the government um, when they file every, every year when they file the taxes is like, okay, I really care about, you know, nice public parks. So then, you know, I think, uh, you know, my tax money should go to the, you know, parks and recreation department or something like that, right? Um, and, and, and I guess it's very interesting because what Andrew Yang was hoping for is actually introducing a private sector mentality among civil servants of the government, right? So, because then what would happen is that, you know, those civil servants, they will be like, well, I hope the taxpayers give the money to me, to, to our department. So then, you know, maybe they'll, they'll become more dynamic. They'll try to be more, you know, customer friendly. You know, they try to do more marketing, you know, they try to show, oh, this is our output. This is, you know, if, if you spend the money with us, you know, this is how beautiful the country is going to be, you know. Um, and, yeah, it, it it sounds like an interesting idea. I think it's very interesting to 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 you know if we could try that. I mean, I'm not sort of like dogmatically, uh, you know, opposed to it. Um, you know, it, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, as long as it's not like too distorting, I would say. Yeah. I mean, if it were to, I mean. Because then the the other issue that you could have is well, you know, what if you spend too much time on the marketing and then, because I mean, at the end of the day, that you know, if you're like a private sector business, I mean, all you care about is is to maximize the revenue, right? I mean, it's like you know, whether the whether the service actually is good or not, I don't know. I mean, um, you know, as long as people bought your stuff, you know, so, um. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, so there's this book that I'm reading right now, Deidre McCloskey, uh, Bourgeois Virtues, and uh, she teaches in, in Chicago, Illinois, and uh, uh, and she makes this very strong case for why capitalism is good, Bourgeois Virtues are good. Uh, and so she, she sort of conflates like the ethics and the culture, which she calls the Bourgeois Virtues, with 
where you might, yeah, you know, with the economic system, which is capitalism, um, and 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 then and then of course there's like the the critics of capitalism, like you know, Marxists, etc., and they say, well, you know, but but capitalism creates inequality, and you know it uh, it marginalizes certain groups of people, and there's you know racism, discrimination in the system, etc. And and then would and then her intellectual move, her response is to blame it on the fallen human nature and not on capitalism. You know, so so she so she argues that capitalism and the bourgeois virtues is is responsible for everything good that the system created, like you know, increased life expectancy and increased literacy and you know whatever positive indicators that that you can uh, measure um and then all of the bad shit you know like inequality and st stuff like that uh, environmental degradation um that's because of fallen human nature so it's sort of like um i don't know a, a biblical uh sort of uh intonation um i don't do, do, you, do you have some thoughts on that argument before i sort of you know drone on to this topic it's a little out of left field but so there is something to be said about certain cultural aspects and cultural virtues in generative societal norms as a result of the capitalist process this isn't a unique idea. This is something that you can find with Max Weber. This is something you can find with almost all of the early sociologists. And maybe over the past 50, 70 years, you've seen increasing critiques towards this notion, but it still seems to be at least a partially hegemonic view. As in, uh, there is a certain argument to be had there. Uh, it's easy to find it ridiculous when one says that all of the positives can be dedicated to one thing, but everything that's bad, every negative externality can be shifted somewhere else, because that's just kind of stupid. Um, so maybe I need to read it to figure out what exactly she's saying, but that that doesn't really work out for me. So take, for instance, a Pareto efficiency distribution for achievements inside of a society. Uh, you could definitely create a market orientation so that the Pareto efficiency is maximized, that the most is produced, that there's the greatest amount of achievement. But at the same time, the very existence of a Pareto efficiency curve necessitates inequality, as in there's no way to get around that. And even if you get rid of a Pareto efficiency curve and you deal with the natural inherent abilities of human beings, that just opens up a bell curve. The bell curve also has inherent inequalities in it. Uh, when one thinks about the role and utility of society uh, to try to minimize those inequalities, a market orientation, something going on? Oh, no, go ahead. Yeah, so the market orientation might result in perhaps the best form of Pareto efficiency, but Pareto efficiency is too often conflated with social well-being and that's not necessarily a tenable position uh, that's why we have mixed market approaches that's why we have environmental protections that's why we have various forms of regulation why the minimum wage is a thing uh, so we understand that perfect efficiency within a market isn't necessarily good and we know that efficiencies within the market can be gained which is why we have anti-monopolistic laws and why we should be pursuing some form of anti-duopolistic or anti-oligopolistic forms of competition because these things create fixed barriers towards actual generation of broad market-based value. If anything, we have a little bit too much of a orientation towards the supply type of production cycle for generating what is supposed to be the optimal curves in society, whereas focusing more on societal demand, which can be equated at times with need. It's unclear the exact differentiation between a need and a demand, except outside of luxury goods. Um, so for instance, like shelter, what actually constitutes the need inside of shelter is something very interesting to debate if we want to get into philosophy. But yeah, the 
the simplification of a dichotomous understanding of uh, good things associated with materialistic culture equals everything positive in society, bad things as a result of it equals flaws in human nature. But I will say that you could also make the case that there is an inherent flaw inside of human nature itself that does result in some problems overall. So Darren Ashmoglu and James Robinson talks about the stickiness of culture. They completely toss out this idea of predeterministic culture along ethnic lines or anything like that. But they do understand that there's a stickiness to culture, a stickiness to the way that things are done. Someone who was raised in an environment whereby there was an established pattern to receive societal success is going to encounter difficulties inside of a system that no longer lives up to this. Uh, perhaps one of the most easy to pick on type tropes of this is uh, the baby boomer generation and millennials. Um, this is something that is talked about all the time. It's dramatically overdone. It's very oversimplified, but it's a very clear case example of culture being sticky so that no matter how much information you pump into one demographic, there's not going to be the same thing as having grown up and acculturated certain values and certain inherent orientations towards the market by growing up in a society that is defined almost by its recessions and its disasters. It's a very different thing from the post-World War II, the American dream is the most easily obtainable thing in the world. So a baby boomer would be the most pro-capitalist relative you, to the younger generation. You would find that orientation, if only because the system is currently set up that way. Now, I think it would be very easy to tweak the system, to tweak the free market approach, to make it so that in 40 years, you might find the millennials turned new baby boomers uh, being far more inclined towards state-oriented solutions and the youngest new demographic, what would it be? Uh, generation B, Generation C, Generation 2040, whatever it is, might be more pro-market. Uh, there's, a, there's a cyclical pattern that can easily be put into this one whereby people are inclined to extol the virtues of that which works when you grow up and mature in a society and to criticize that which doesn't. Uh, so for instance, uh, we might envision a clear, steady pass towards ever increasing amount of market intervention and an ever increasing disestablishmentarian approach to capitalism. But that might not be true. Uh, I, I don't know what the future holds. And if it's possible for an Andrew Yang-like approach that can create fixes, then you might find people who are satisfied in a new system that are far more protective of it than the critics that have been grown over the past 40 years. So, yeah, there's something definitely to be said about culture. And of course, that's just native acculturation inside of a system. It, it gets even more exaggerated if you have someone who's imported from one system and dropped into a new system. So for instance, whether or not anyone can really fully assimilate or fully adapt themselves to conditions in another society is entirely up in the air. I don't know if I could ever become German. I don't speak German, you speak German, so maybe you could do it more easily than me. But if I was just randomly thrown into Berlin and I was told to make sense of my life and try to adapt myself, I'm not sure what I would be. I'm not sure where I would fit in. I'm not sure what my orientation towards that society would become. And I would probably be far more critical of that system than if I was, say, born into it and could speak fluent German and blah, 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 blah. There's a certain stickiness to culture. And then over time, it changes. So for instance, uh, broadly speaking, patterns across ethnic lines of culture are far less exaggerated than patterns that are two to three generations removed. So for instance, uh, a Gen Z Latino has more in common with a Gen Z Asian or Gen Z white person than you would necessarily have with a baby boomer or a silent generation of the same category which is pretty interesting. It goes to show that there's a, a socialization process that is far stronger than perhaps some of the insecurities that is being expressed in modern political discourse would suggest. So for instance, a, another driver of um, differentiation in terms of um, like the 
ethnicization of political points of view also has a lot to do with demographic aging. Uh, the average age of someone in some communities is substantially higher than other groups. So I think um, I think it's almost a generational gap of 12 years, 15 years. I, I'm unsure. I, I feel like I definitely need to check that statistic before I make too much of a claim. But that's almost an entire generational shift. That'd be comparing a millennial to a Gen Z person. And at that point, it might not even be entirely fair to draw broad-based comparisons between the two. But yeah, culture has a stickiness to it, but it definitely can't be blamed for everything. Like that, that doesn't make any sense to me. Going back to that book, I, I, that that seems too Manichaean, too wrong to me. Yeah, I mean, so I, I, I still welcome like McCloskey's contribution because you know you need to have like sort of like one strong position to take i mean it's a similar with like milton friedman i mean there was like almost everything i read in his work and capitalism and freedom uh, free to choose uh i disagreed with almost everything that he said but um but i still appreciated the the intellectual clarity of that uh, sort of like mm. libertarian position right um and um yeah and mccloskey does something very similar here um but uh, but I would certainly agree that, you know, the blanket statement of, you know, that, you know, whatever good comes out of capitalism, I think, um, is, it, it is a simplification, which I, I, I don't find sustainable, you know, whatsoever, because, so, of course, like the overall progress thesis, I mean, if you go to Steven Pinker, he makes a similar claim, right? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think obviously, like you know, this at at the like really you know macro level, you know, when you look at things like you know standard of living, life expectancy, literacy, and things like that, um, yeah, I don't think that it can be denied that you know capitalism is is an important driver of that progress. Um, but there's also you know negative externalities that we are starting to face in all honesty um you know and so the, the the two big ones is you know the fourth industrial revolution which you already raised earlier um you know like what do you do if you throw too many people out of work and then and then the second problem is is environmental degradation you know it's like we we sort of up until this point we sort of believed uh, that you know, nature's cornucopia, and we could sort of draw as much resources as we want out of it. And, you know, there wouldn't be any, you know, physical constraints or limits. And now we know that this is not true. I mean, I mean, if you look like, for instance, the, uh, the, the weather forecast and like, you know, the Western US where, like, you know, the record temperature is being hit. Uh, Lake Mead is at the lowest level um, that it's ever been in. Um, you know, the federal government might declare water emergency, which means they're going to be cutting uh, water supplies by 25%. Uh, and it's just like, well, it's just 2021. I mean, it's like, what are we going to see in five years? What are they going to see in 10 years? I mean, it, 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 like those kinds of headlines being with, with much greater frequency. So, you know, with all of this like argument about civilizational advances that we have seen i would say that um i don't know i th i i almost feel like we're already like on, a, on this downward curve to its in, in, in <laughs> civilizational terms um i hope not yeah yeah i mean it's it's like i mean unless you know jeff bezos he's retiring this summer from from amazon and uh, first that i didn't know okay that's big news I that's big news that and uh and, and he said the first thing he's gonna do to celebrate his retirement i guess is to uh go on his uh, space flight because that's what the blue origin uh, that's what this project is about right he's been investing in it the last 10 years or so and uh and now there's been like this petition that's been going around that says um jeff bezos once you go out to outer space don't come back <laughs> but um 
No, but, but I guess like uh, on all earnesty, I think that if Bezos or Musk, you know, one of these billionaires, um, you know, of course with with NASA subsidies and NASA funding, uh, obviously that's that's what SpaceX and Blue Origin is driven by in part. Um, you know, if they're actually able to to conquer outer space and make it habitable, um, then I I could be convinced that you know capitalism is the greatest human invention and we should keep going with it. You know. Uh, so it's funny that you mentioned the space domain because we actually are seeing capitalism pull us further and further and further into space. So, for instance, the space domain, the space war, the space competition, it ended when the Soviet Union fell apart. And the United States cut back a lot on its civilian expenditures in space. And there was the general idea, the general understanding that space was important, it was necessary. I mean, the Air Force loved space. GPS is from the Air Force used to be until it got transferred over into the Space Force. But something very interesting happened when you saw an increase in two things. First was China's interest in space. And the second one was American corporate investment in space. And when you saw those two things go on, there was the dramatic push back into space. As in interest has never been higher institutions are building entire research programs designed for space. There's a recent space program that's being developed in Georgia Tech. I ran into a couple of people that are working on it. So it's moving in a way that I'm unsure how you would weigh the ratios, the ratios, the ratios of great power competition versus corporate expenditures in space. But no matter what it is, it's pretty clear that we're going there, and it's pretty clear that there's an increased desire to send human beings much further than they were before. And there's also this desire to try to bring space materials down to Earth because you can become a trillionaire by owning an asteroid. As in, that's not a joke. There are asteroids that are worth trillions of dollars up there. So if you're able to send a couple of billion dollars of uh, space probes and equipment up there, then you become a trillionaire. I mean, how do is. you make that valuation? I mean, does it work like the art market? You know, it's the completely arbitrary, you know, like billionaires betting on it. You just make current market price for a good and you imagine to bring it down. And if you're able to control it adequately so it doesn't turn into, say, the Spaniards ransacking the new world for gold, creating inflationary pressure everywhere, uh, so that the that's a bad example. So the supply curve and the demand curve doesn't fundamentally warp itself out of existence. Then you could very easily own assets that are dramatic. So for instance, um, iron is pretty high up there in case you wanted to do iron smelting. Uh, precious minerals, rare earth minerals, things like that are in space that you could use. There's also gold and platinum and silver plenty. Uh, like these things, if they aren't just balls of ice, like comets, uh, the heavy metal ones like asteroids, uh, they are a very large amount of money if you're able to make them worth something. And previously, we have had no capability to do that, but we're developing. So there was a Japanese space probe that went to a, I forget if it was an asteroid or a comet, probably an asteroid because comets are more unstable, went there, picked up some of their stuff and brought it back to Earth. As in, it took like eight years or 10 years to do it, but it did it. So if you're able to establish a, a platform like that, and you're able to dramatically expand assets in space so that those long timetables no longer become a problem. Uh, so for instance, like if you have something going out once a month for 10 years, then when it's finally time for it to come back, you'd get something new every month. It just requires that you dramatically expand your infrastructure. And then there's also the gateway project that's designed to put a lot of people on the moon, a lot of platforms on the moon, which is also going on. And the moon is also filled with a whole bunch of material that you have 
on the Earth's surface. And you can't exactly screw up the moon's environment. <laughs> there are no rivers or lakes or atmosphere over there. So you could be as wasteful as you want, I suppose, if you want to be cynical about it. But I think that we are going to go out into space. So in that, in that statement you brought up earlier, I think that you'll find we are going to go there. I think the only reason why we might not go there as fast as we would, might want to is because of dragging domestic pressure inside of the U.S. system. As in, how much money can we afford to spend on far-sighted future advancements in space when, say, the United States economy is recovering from a pandemic and there's a lot of unmet social needs on planet Earth that aren't being addressed? Uh, so that's just the spaceman stuff. But there's a secondary component to this one, which is <laughs> whether or not we peaked as a civilization, even if you just get rid of space. And I think that we are entering into a period where things could either go really bad or really good. So for instance, with CRISPR and CRISPR-related biotechnologies, uh, these are things that are unlocking the way in which the human body behaves or bio, biology itself more broadly behaves in a way that we would never, never have been able to do before. And when you marry that with artificial intelligence and general tools to create some good pattern recognition for this stuff, you find people who believe in the ability to make the human body effectively immortal, assuming you don't get struck by lightning or get into a car crash. As in, that's not anywhere close to real now, but it is becoming increasingly theoretically possible. Uh, along with the idea of engaging in broader forms of biotechnological research, which I had an interesting chat with someone who advised the president at one point, saying that, yes, you could make Jurassic Park, but they wouldn't be real dinosaurs, because if they were real dinosaurs, they have no uh, economic, uh, they don't have the same biological system, so they'd likely die. And I said, well, you could make things that look like them. She said, yeah, but then they wouldn't be real dinosaurs. And I think that she, I think that that was meant to be more dismissive than it actually was because one of the things behind this idea of cracking the genetic code to be able to design it infinitely the infinite malleability of genetic design is mind-boggling so there's the uh, rna or mrna vaccines you could use that to isolate certain forms of cancers and get rid of them they're working on ways to make that type of vaccine-like approach useful for getting rid of cancer. Um, they are working on different ways to try to isolate how dementia and Alzheimer's develops inside of the human brain. They are working on ways to effectively reverse patterns of aging inside of uh, muscles and skeletal functions inside of the human body. They're developing ways to grow organs for human transplant that doesn't have anything to do with that. Now, in complete fairness, these technologies terrify me because they have horrendous implications for abuse. And I don't think people are nearly as conscious of that as they should be. A book you should probably read if you're interested in biotechnologies is A Crack in Creation by Jennifer Dudna and someone else and they are very optimistic right, yeah. about what they're doing. I read that book, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're very optimistic about what they're doing, but you can read that they're responding to a criticism that they've received because over and over and over again, they say, we don't think that we're Robert Oppenheimer. We don't think that we have become death, the destroyer of worlds. And all I can think of is, you don't know that yet. You could be. Because if you take a look at, for instance, biotechnological terrorism or weaponization of certain viruses and diseases, it's never been easier. And CRISPR-related technology has also never been cheaper. Uh, there's a mass democratization of this technology that is a little bit scary, not so much that it's democratized, but that it's a very dangerous weapon to leave in the hands of people that perhaps shouldn't have it. Uh, so for instance, you could weaponize certain forms of uh, viral equipment to make certain groups more likely to be sterile, which alone is enough to blow your mind and make this one of the 
most terrifying things in the world. And it gets much, 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 much worse. And I don't even want to say it out loud because I don't want to give people ideas. <laughs> uh, let's just say that I don't like CRISPR. I love CRISPR, but I don't like CRISPR. Yeah, I also what has to be said, I mean, in defense of uh, Jennifer Doudna, um, and Emmanuel Charpentier was the, the French researcher who also worked on that uh, technology. Okay. Um, is that, you know, it, it's not only them who, yeah. who make yeah. that uh, decision about what's happening with it, right? So with, yeah. with the technology. So, um, you know, sort of the, the trepidation and the fear comes from the fact that, you know, they're creating it for ostensibly a good purpose. And, but somebody else could take it and do something bad with it. Uh, and, and, but it's outside of their control because, you know, once you, you know, publish uh, a scientific paper where you basically lay out the steps as to, you know, how to reproduce um, the technology, um, you, it, it's out of your control, right? I mean, mm -hmm. people could do whatever they want with that, with that piece of knowledge, right? Um, and um, I, so I think Darno would make a very good point here is that, well, so, so that government regulation would be necessary. Um, but then the issue, of course, is, you know, you know, what if the government officials also don't know what's happening? I mean, it's almost like, you know, when the tech giants went to a congressional testimony and, uh, you know, the Congress members didn't actually know how the business model operated with the tech companies. So, mm -hmm. um, and the same issue I would assume would exist for, you know, biotechnology where... It definitely does. Yeah, I would say, I mean, if, if you're a lawmaker, I mean, I think, you know, you probably care more about like re-election uh, than you do about like studying the in intricacies of the uh, of biotechnology. So, um, so when... Once, yeah, I, I, I definitely want to pick up on something that you're saying about whether or not something is explicable or knowledgeable to people in government. Once upon a time, there was this idea that government, the military, and industry were so in bed with one another that it constituted the military industrial complex. And this was seen as one of the most fundamental threats to uh, American society because the watchmen were also the watchers, that there was a certain amount of overlap and people transitioned between the two readily and easily. The thing is though, what Dwight Eisenhower was famously criticizing doesn't really exist anymore. So the military industrial complex is on life support. Silicon Valley and the information revolution has very little in common with the old form of say, Pratt and Whitney, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, um, name a company that you can throw with a stone throw like North Grumman. These type of industries are not as closely connected. And there's a decent amount of pushback whenever they become more so. So for instance, Google has perhaps been one of the more prominent ideas of trying to befriend certain elements inside of Washington DC and the military side of things. But their employees almost revolted over it a couple of times. And one of their former leaders, a guy by the name of Schmidt, is very much trying to establish a stronger relationship there. But the relationship isn't there. It's still very bifurcated. What you see instead is that there's far more ties between uh, Washington DC and the corporate governance world, as in the Fortune 500, as in older forms of legacy systems that don't actually provide much in the way of awareness about just where the system is going. So the most advanced forms of bioengineering technologies or information technologies or even social media is not something that they've been trained to deal with in the horse trading business. As in once upon a time, you walk around an area in DC and you can literally find just about everywhere you need to go. But 
the rise of the internet might have been facilitated by ARPA or DARPA, might have been facilitated by the military, but it is not in their control anymore. In fact, we even got rid of ICANN. That is something that the powers that be, if you want to call them that, don't have as much awareness of or control over. There's a anxiety related to that, as in the politicians that feel as though that they used to know what the world was about and no longer do, are now trying to throw regulation upon regulation or try to adapt certain standards that they used to have, but find that they no longer have. But it's haphazard, it's done without sophistication, and it's done without it any real necessary knowledge of what's going on there. If anything, it seems to be mostly the result of whatever the staffers write and then get supported by the people who are in charge. And some of that has to do with generational divides. So that stickiness of generational stuff. As in, if you take a look at the average age, the average age almost goes up a year every time a year passes. There's not a lot of turnover. And that is a problem because you are dealing with people who grew up in a type of relationship that no longer exists. And then you could read a book by the guy named Chris Bros, who wrote a book called The Kill Chain, which is all about trying to recapture that he wouldn't put it that way, but I would put it that way, that it's trying to recapture that type of relationship so that the United States isn't completely taken be by behind by fundamental changes in the way that things are done, because that's not true in other societies. So for instance, um, civil fusion inside of China has very strong interoperability between information technology, the military, and advances in science, in large part because China's modern infrastructure is modern, it's new. Their Iron Triangle, their military industrial complex grew up in the 90s and early 2000s, following the opening up of Deng Xiaoping and Gaiga Kaifang and all this stuff. It, it's much more recent, it's much more modern, and the people who are currently leading Beijing have a far more nuanced understanding of this one. You find something very similar in Russia because Russia's old way of doing things died in the 80s and 90s. And then it was fundamentally recreated in, under very different systems. One might call it a kleptocratic autocracy if you really wanna go around it. But this different system had a new orientation in the way that the Kremlin deals with business, deals with information technologies, deals with advancements in societies. And I mean, half of it they decided to throw out because in China doesn't, uh, Russia doesn't compete in half of the things that we think that they do. Uh, they've just chosen the things that they're good at. And some of the things they're good at, they're really good at. Uh, we don't need to go down too far on that military road. Um, and then you see a similar pattern in the United States happening inside of Europe. And that's also deeply distressing because it leaves us blindsided in a certain sense, that we don't actually really necessarily know where the system is taking us. And we've, last, we've lost our faith in our institutions that would be our most profound guide in trying to navigate the world in the future, so that we're left with various forms of simulated reality fed to us by different forces inside of the political and media landscape that result in prepackaged forms of uh, political expressions that are unhelpful for dealing with the modern world. That's very Noam Chomsky of me. <laughs> very Noam Chomsky of me. But it's a mess because we don't have those types of ties that we used to have, which means that what do we try to do? Do we try to recreate a military industrial complex so that people don't understand everything? I think quite a few people would be very unhappy with that. But you do need to find a way that the people who are in charge of governance, who are in charge of legislation, who are in charge of the policies that will fundamentally shape the years to come, we need to find a way to make sure that they are aware of the technologies that are on the horizon, understand the implications of those technologies and are able to incorporate that understanding into their current models of governance and jurisprudence. Because if they keep treating things the way that they were in the 20th century, in the 1990s or 80s, so when I was alive in the 1990s, I think we're rapidly losing sight of the fact that that is now over a generation's old. 
as in it's not being adapted in the way that it should be. Well, I mean, I think practically the only way how you can get uh, government officials back into the loop um, is if some of these, you know, technology companies, um, like the people who work there, um, would be attracted to work for the government. I mean, the civil servants. Um, and and I, I know, like, I, it, it's not going to be a simple transition because, because um, okay, well, you know, the civil servant gets paid eighty to hundred thousand dollars, and then you probably get paid three, four times as much in technology companies. So um, the transition, like you know, like in Singapore, what they do is. Um, they peg the civil service salaries to the private sector, yeah. um, which you could say, well, it's it's not cheap. It's expensive. I mean, like they're obviously you know, having to raise tax revenues to fund those uh, salary raises. Um, but you know, if you go to you know the global corruption index, you know, like Singapore is always at the top, meaning lowest corruption, right, in the world next to Scandinavia, like Denmark and stuff. Um, and so, it, it, right, so, I mean, it, 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 you know, the government, I mean, if, if they were sort of interested in sort of trying to keep pace. Um, now, now, obviously, like, um, you know, would the government itself become the innovator? Well, I mean, of course, we have the historical precedent for it, uh, but, you know, with DARPA and stuff. Um, but it would be sort of like an ecosystem where you mm -hmm. know the public and the private sector would be working together. Um, where, you know, I mean, essentially, the way how it works is that the uh, is that the government writes the checks. You know, like this is, um, and then the private sector would, uh, and the university labs um, would basically work together to uh, implement. Um, you know, if you look at the. Yeah, the history of mRNA, you know, the messenger RNA technology, which is very crucial for the, you know, development of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. Um, you know, so, the, you know, there was a lab at University of Pennsylvania, um, you know, different universities. Um, and uh, there was the NIH, you know, the NIH was the one that uh, helped develop the Moderna drug. Um and uh yeah that's that's a sort of cooperation that that i want to see basically across different uh sectors of the you know you could say innovation economy um and you know i, I think you know like the us is a sort of like location where this could happen i think there's still advantages that we have here i mean the fact that you have a lot of you know, foreign researchers that, you know, uh, coming on to, to the U.S. to, you know, study in universities. Uh, and that, of course, would be the stepping stone to get in here uh, and, um, you know, work in research laboratories, the private sector. Um, and, yeah, and, and, and receive, you know, huge, you know, government funding contracts. Um, and, yeah, we we definitely you know should support that that ecosystem uh, much more. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with like the Mazzucato argument, uh, Mariana Mazzucato, and the entrepreneurial state, and uh, uh, and she, I mean, she basically makes the argument that you know the state, uh, the state always has to provide the environment, you know, and the funding uh, to to make innovations possible. Um, and um, yeah, and that, that that's, you know, of course, if you want to bang on and on about innovation uh, and give examples of that, I think, you know, that gives us a, a good taste for why capitalism is, is great and, and so forth. And um, um, and I mean, I, I, I value these parts of it as well, but, um, you know, uh, I, I just don't know whether our innovative capacity is going to, is going to, you know, save us from climate change. Um, 
you know, so there, there, there's this argument now about, you know, okay, we're going to increase the funding for, you know, solar energy, solar panels. We're going to make it more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to create more windmills and things like that. Um, it, it sounds very promising. I, I don't know whether that will, you know, be, be the solution for us. Um, it's a little bit too optimistic. I think some of the bigger changes that would make a big difference would be um, it would be consumer shift. It would be essentially the idea that like, do you have to go to like, you know, South Pacific Island uh, on a vacation every single year? You know, maybe do this, you know, every five years or something like that, you know, or um, yeah, it, it's, it would basically it would have to be some, you know, there would have to be some structural consumer shift that would uh, drastically reduce the, uh, the burden of carbon emissions. Um, well, we are seeing an overall decline in carbon emissions in a lot of industrialized countries, uh, what we would call information economies or post-industrial economies. We're seeing dramatic declines. Uh, yeah, yeah, but then also... There's a trade-off though, because it's growing elsewhere. Uh, exactly have... right. So if if you like, if you buy made in China clothes or products, mm -hmm. um, so the carbon budget would increase in China. Um, but but if, but the, if the end product is consumed in America, I mean, then you know it, it doesn't fall on on America, right? I, I understand what you're saying there, although there is a cross comparison to be made. So for instance, in China, there is more lax environmental regulations so that uh, making a shirt in the United States would produce less waste than making a shirt inside of China. Uh, so for instance, there's a even more negative trade-off in that sense. But we do find that our processes for generation that we have per unit is also still improving. Um, so it's interesting. Yeah, it only matters if most of the products are made in USA. I mean, but that's not what's happening. Right? Uh, it, it does. It, it it does because the technology that we're using in the United States will eventually be adopted inside of China if it's not already being adopted already. So one of the things that China has been doing is that once the smog detector started showing just how bad air pollution was inside of China and Beijing. The US embassy started tweeting out the average air quality index for the day. And then suddenly word got around and people got really unhappy. And then the government started changing its mind about whether or not to just allow smog to exist. Um, that's probably one of the most interesting anecdotes. We don't know who actually made that index. Uh, it, it might just have been an intern that was there and thought it was a good idea to put it on Twitter, which would be a, a really, really amazing contribution of just someone who did something without real full implications of it, because that decision will fundamentally change the way that China deals with environmental regulation. So China is very big behind its greening the desert initiative because China faced massive desertification for almost 40 years, maybe even longer. The Gobi Desert stretched down. Most of the sandstorms weren't from pre-existing age-old deserts, the dust storms that we saw inside of Northern China. They were from newly created deserts, newly introduced infertility, newly introduced soil erosion. So right now they're planting trees everywhere and they're trying to make that work. Uh, they're working on trying to be more conscious in their water usage. There was such a big push for green energy, like the energy that one would do from hydraulics, so hydrological and hydroelectricity, uh, by tapping things with dams, that you would find rivers that had a dam almost every mile to the point where at the end of the river, there was almost nothing coming out of the dam anymore. And this was something that allowed for insane amounts of electrical development. Now, this also has trade-offs because there are fish that lived inside of there that don't anymore. 
but you're seeing a massive transition. You're also seeing that for green energy production, that the lead developer of solar panels and wind energy isn't the United States anymore, it's China. And this fundamental earth shattering shift is leading in a way where we might still be able to get the same results for few enough negative environmental externalities that we might be able to adapt in time to prevent some of the more disastrous or egregious effects. Another thing to play around with is that there's carbon capturing technology. I mean, even if you wanted to do a really crude method, you could create algae farms whose sole purpose is to suck up carbon dioxide, and then you could bury them underground or throw them into space or do something with them that would change the composition of it so that when they die, the carbon dioxide isn't returned into the atmosphere, as in something to do with it, i.e. clean coal is just you bury the coal underground, the um, CO2 underground, then it gets absorbed into dirt and soil. So there are a bunch of different ways that are going around this. And one really cool thing is for droughts, you, there's growing pressure to engage inside of desalination projects. So for instance, Israel is not a country that could survive on its own water resources. It desalinates a lot of its water. The same is true for Ar many Arab countries along the, along the desert region. So Saudi Arabia does it too. And I think you're going to see an increased pressure and an increased push to have this developed along the West Coast, particularly in drought ridden zone, and then transfer that water inland to deal with local agricultural needs and local water consumption needs so that you could put less strain on pressure from uh, water reserves and rivers flowing from the Southwestern United States that are desert, as in, a lot of southwestern the United States is a desert, and we've been using water resources recklessly for an environment that was never meant to do them. So if anything, people moving out of San Diego and Los Angeles might actually be better for the overall economic health of the country if they just suddenly started showing up in Florida or Georgia or Alabama, because there's no water pressure problems at all in the eastern half of the United States, at least not yet. So yeah, I, I'm a little bit more optimistic. I, I think we might be able to do this. And I think that what is done in the US and what is done in China will eventually be exported around the world because China is the new factory of the world. The US is the old factory of the world. And wherever the two of us go, that is almost half of the global economy. So I think we're gonna be good. <laughs> yeah, just on you know, one interesting project that the Chinese have done, um, the Three Gorges Dam, um, which was a somewhat controversial project, but, you know, in an authoritarian country, you can sort of pull this off. Um, yep. Where I guess the idea was to transfer water from south to north, right? Because it uh, rains less in the north. Um, and, um, yeah, and then the issue was that you know, there would be some villages that would be flooded as a result of uh, building the dam. Uh, and um, yeah, but they built it nonetheless. And I mean, I, I was wondering whether the US would sort of, in order to salvage the Southwest, you know, they would sort of try to do something similar. It's like, yeah, yeah let's, you know, build these like giant canal systems that basically pump um, you know, excess rainwater from the eastern seaboard to, uh, down to the southwest. We might eventually do something like that. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. we'll do something like that. Well, something. yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is like, this would be the way, this would be the way out. I mean, um, because, you know, it's, you know, people build houses, they build existence there and they're like, well, you know, I, really like it there so um and yeah i mean uh, so yeah there would be a way to uh to, to save that area i mean um yeah, yeah so I mean, arizona and new mexico are not long-term viable situations right now we're gonna need to find a way to fix that yeah uh 
I mean, I just had a bunch of friends that moved down to Arizona, and to, <laughs> it's like, I, and 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 I, and I and I and I and I said to them, well, I mean, is isn't the heat going to be an issue for you? And then they said, no, no, actually, because it's low humidity, right? So because over here, when it gets really hot in the eastern seaboard, I mean. You know, we can have really, really steamy, humid days, right? So that's what I had in mind. But, uh, but because they barely have any any rainfall down there, so it's like it's always dry heat. So it's like, oh, you know, look, you know, all of the sweat pearls is coming down, right? Um, but I mean, I, I I don't know. There's there's still a cutoff point, right? It's where it's like, okay, if you get up to 100, 115 degrees, then maybe. You know, I mean, the human body starts dying at I think like 107, 109 degrees. As in the cells of your skin will start to die. And if your brain overheats, you die. 115 degrees, humidity won't be a problem if you aren't smart about it. Like, if anything, when you said that, I thought they were going to say air conditioning, <laughs> which is a, a small environmental disaster of its own, but it does have a habit of making very uncomfortable places livable well well actually the introduction of air conditioning i would say um second half of the 20th century that that was the secret behind the you know the shift to the sun belt right i mean that, that you know all of a sudden you see you know corporations building up in you know in texas and things like that i mean it could only be possible if it um if you have air conditioning, because um, otherwise, you know, these are, yeah, these are almost unlivable conditions. I mean, I, I guess like the, I mean, you could always be like a rancher, a farmer or something like that. Um, <laughs> you can you know, be. Yeah, but I mean, for like the average person, I mean, like if you if you lived in, in, in a city, I mean, like I, I, I yesterday visited friends in Philadelphia and, and of course, yesterday was a really bad day because it was like, you know, steamy and humid. And, um, and I, I, I knew my body was like totally spoiled by sitting in air conditioned rooms uh, all day. And uh, it was really tough, man. Like I had to come home and dump like, you know, two bottles of water. Right. So, um but uh yeah it's it, it's it, it yeah i mean it, it, it's definitely the case that you know you can only live in uh you know certain environments but i mean but but people are also very very adjustable i mean this is what uh this is what the air conditioning would suggest but then the problem is that you know air conditioning does have the externality right that you know because because it, it does produce more heat, you know, you see the outside the air conditioning unit, you know, it it turns and uh, it emits a lot of heat itself. And, um, and it emits CO2 as well, right? Um, because yeah, I must assume because it, because it sucks electricity and... Yeah, yeah. It, it's not necessarily going to make CO2. It has nothing like that, but... If it doesn't have green energy production, it will have more adverse effects. And I think uh, there's a pretty funny, not funny, there's a pretty scary thing going on in Texas right now because more people are moving into Texas. Population of Texas is growing. They added two or three new House of Representative seats inside of the place because of just how big they're growing. Their grid didn't last in the summer and it looks as though that it might not didn't last in the winter and it looks like it won't last in the summer if they aren't careful so there were guidelines put out saying be very careful about your energy consumption because otherwise things could break in their grid and yeah texas doesn't exactly generate energy from green energy sources it's mostly coal and oil i think so that's not exactly green energy production. Yeah, it's extremely worrying. I mean, so this idea of, um, you know, uh, climate change resilience, um, like the word resilience, I think, you know, it's going to play a much bigger role as we go on um, because, 
because it, it is going to get tougher. I mean, um, and also you consider, I mean, like Texas, I mean, it's one of the richest states that we have or one of the yeah, richest places yeah. in the world, basically. But, um, you know, if you look at the migrants that come from um, Central America, I mean, I was reading some report about, um, you know, the, I guess it's like some kind of drought that's happening in uh, in Central America, and yeah, uh, and then you add to that like you know lack of government, uh, gang violence. Um, it's a nightmare. People, Cent- Central America is a nightmare for a lot of migrants coming up north. Yeah. So and and then of course you know we saw like the speech by Kamala Harris a couple of weeks back, and she says you know don't come, and. Like just understanding the structural issues, I mean, it's gonna fall on deaf ears because you know, because if 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 you have nothing back home, you know, you're gonna to want to, you know, migrate. I mean, it's just it, it's literally, I guess, survival uh, versus uh, uh, death, right? Um, the breakdown in relationships is frightening in a certain way and it's by no means limited to central america so one of the things that we're going to see particularly in africa is what happens when the lived memory of the decolonial movement starts to go away Uh, what happens when environmental pressures start putting a lot of strain on a society facing large population growth rates and you're going to see large movements of people and they aren't going to have very many places to go. So for instance, a Central American person who wants to leave, they can go north or they can go south. And if they are able to move to Costa Rica and stay in Costa Rica, or able to move to Panama and stay in Panama, all for the good. But not a lot of people are able to. Um, But if they're going to go north, they're going to go north until they reach the United States or Canada. And they're willing to risk almost anything to do so because of the innate pressures inside of their local societies are geared in that direction. Um, So for instance, I found it strange that, when was this? Refugees were deliberately excluded from cartel violence. I forget when this was, but it was done to make it so that you and your entire family could be targeted for a death squad. But because it wasn't deemed political persecution, you wouldn't be considered a refugee because there was this idea that this is criminality and fleeing from criminality is different from fleeing from political prosecution. But when societies break down, and it's not a exaggeration to say that society is broken down in several large portions of Central America, the resulting quandary is such that there is a corrupt fusion between criminality and politics, such that it is almost impossible to distinguish the two. So if you're able to just define problems you don't like as criminal problems, then there's no recourse. It is move or die. And there are a lot of people that will move. And we need to find a way to establish some form of arrangement that is able to walk the line between the hardest of hard borders and certain death for these people and what might be the reverse of that. So, yeah, I mean, also, we need to to work with that. Yeah. The proportionality is very important, right? So, if you take these. You know, three countries, you know, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador. I mean, yeah. Add up the population, it's like a little more than 10 million, I think. Yeah. And, um, you know, we have 330 million people in America already. And so, like, okay, imagine the worst case scenario, which basically means every single person <laughs> leaves, right? So, let's say 10 million. And 10 million of them plug them around the US. Yeah. But they're still. We said you know, they would increase the population by three, two or three percent or so, right? Um, yeah, if anything, it would overcome the 
budgetary shortfall of declining demographics if you're able to space it out. Yeah, exactly. So, so I, I'm I'm not I'm not sure exactly about you know the fundamental worry here. I mean, except that you know maybe it's going to set the precedent where it's like, hey, what about you know the rest of Latin America? And so Venezuela comes Africa. to mind. Venezuela comes to mind as a very clear example of this one because Venezuela is still falling apart. It's just that news fatigue set in. So people starving to death in a system that's literally dying in front of our eyes no longer really ignites a passionate interest. What is a small Venezuelan community in, in South Florida um, next to the Cubans? But uh, but they tend to be people who have money, right? Because you can just take an airplane up to Miami. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, so for the people who are sort of like less well endowed, um, spilling over into Colombia. Yeah, Suriname, Colombia would be Brazil. Yeah, yeah the, Brazil. Yeah, there's a bunch of countries where uh, where they would be. And, and now I saw like this news report where they interviewed some uh, Venezuelans uh, who actually returned uh, back to Venezuela because 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 they also find like very unreceptive communities in in, in the other countries because yeah yeah For because. All that yeah they don't, they don't really have like like inviting immigration cultures necessarily right um no for all of our problems um, we are still one of the most receptive groups to uh, migratory pressures from these areas for instance if you're able to get here and you're able to work through our system our system is still one of the most receptive ones at least inside of the western hemisphere uh, canada had an interesting about face so they were more accepting when Donald Trump became more politicized. But then after a couple of years, they actually got rid of a lot of their policies that were meant to make them more open. Uh, so like, there's almost no places for these people to go. There's a general operating assumption that, hey, you're from a nearby country, you have a lot in common. So naturally people will open you with, welcome you with open arms, but that almost never happens. Um, it happens in some circumstances, but in the long run, uh, there's a strong pressure against this. You can see this even ignoring Latin America when we were dealing with migrants from Syria. So large numbers of Syrian migrants went to local countries and uh, there were intense backlashes against this. And the Syrian migratory pattern was, if anything, an echo of an earlier Palestinian migration. So Palestinians moved out into Egypt, moved out into Syria, moved out into Jordan. Uh, for instance, I think Jordan's sixth largest city was a refugee camp for a little while. And that type of pressure also sparked a lot of problems. Um, people have a underlying belief that local communities of nations will take care of each other, and they really don't. Um, if you take a look at what's actually provided, uh, how integration works, um, it, it's not as good as the United States. And it's actually kind of sad that that's sometimes considered a controversial statement now because of the legacy of Donald Trump, but it doesn't change the fact that we are. And yeah, so we just need to try to find the right balance between a rhetoric that is centered around zero tolerance and please don't come and whatever you do don't come uh, from Kamala Harris and changing the way we define things because I'm aware it sounds almost contradictory to what I said earlier but it's something that we need to find some way of mutually negotiating for the better right I mean so the practical solution like if i was the leader of the country i mean look i mean i would have said the same thing i mean i would have said to them don't come but 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 to my civil servants you know i would say you know department of homeland security um i would say look i mean they're just going to come to the border and we're going to have to admit some of them yeah um i mean maybe 20 percent or something like that um you know have to ne negotiate it obviously politically um and and then and then over time you know let's say after 
10 years of residence, you know, we're going to have to give them green cards, you know, um, and, and, you know, we're going to have to, because, I mean, also like if they come, mm-hmm. especially if they're young people in their early 20s, uh, you know, which means that they likely have U.S. born children, so they become citizens automatically. Uh, so, I mean, and we've had a lot of, you know, we have a bunch of cases where, you know, because you have mixed status families because the parents are undocumented and then, oh, well, you know, so that means that they have to go home. And then in some cases, like they, they have this weird arrangement where, you know, they, they would just live right across the border in Mexico and and the kids would basically drive with a bus to school uh, in a U.S. school just in a border town and then they would come home every day. I mean... I, I think it's a pretty crazy kind of way of, of trying to, you know, organize family life because it's still, I think it's still disruptive. Yep. Reminds um, me of Nogales. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, th- I think some kind of solution would be that, you know, yeah, it's sort of like a split rhetoric, right? It's like mm-hmm. you, you tell them don't come, but you, but you still take on some and then you have to give them like a long-term legal status. Yeah. Uh, so, for instance, um, a lot of ICE encounters that are going on with um, coming undocumented migrants into the United States, they're coming across people that have been put inside of train cars or have been put inside of um, cargo trucks, not cargo trucks, those big trucks that don't really have adequate ventilation. And they're locked in and Sometimes there's 20 of them, sometimes there are 50 of them, and they're just baked in heat with almost nothing. And if they are not adequately taken care of, they'll all die. And there are reports of ice coming across carts of, like, I I don't need to make a gory scene, but just a lot of dead people that they come across who just died in the heat because there was no adequate preserves for them. The conditions that they're coming from to get here are sufficiently bad enough to risk not just expulsion, not just short-term detention, but death. And if you follow a lot of reports of individual migrants that go alone, those are usually stories that are paved with various forms of assault of both physical and sexual natures. And it's just a mess. So. I, I wouldn't even say that only 20% of people who actually get here are accepted. It's, it depends on the dynamic of the people who come here. Um, so for instance, undocumented migrants who are minors usually aren't just tossed back without any real review. There's an entire separate system, an entire separate infrastructure in place, which is part of the reason why there was such a competition, not competition, such a controversy of Donald Trump separating the families, because once they were separated, then they all got sucked into a separate system, which had an entirely separate bureaucracy, which had an entirely separate selection mechanism for where people went. That meant that it was difficult for the authorities that actually captured people to even know where any of them went, which is why there was a lot of problems with that. Yeah, the family separation was a really bad uh, policy. Also, I mean, the idea that if you're an unaccompanied minor, uh, you know, you would have a higher chance of staying than like the whole family. That, yeah, that, that to me that, is also bad policy. You know? That incentivizes you sending your kid across the border alone. And um, there was a report a little while ago, I, I forget where it was, but it was just a series of anecdotal stories of parents with nine to 14 year olds shipping them across border with um, just not really any provisions, trying to get them over there, trying to get them to a place where they could find some amount of security. And it's messed up. It it is. Right. I I I think, you know, it's important that like, yeah, that, that, that there shouldn't be this kind of distinction. I mean, like you either take in the whole family or, you would deport the whole family, right? I mean, there's, there's, there isn't like this, um, 
your arbitrary like split up of uh, of families right um yeah but but overall i think migration it's is it's a big issue so um so in northern morocco there's this uh, enclave which is called uh, melia and ceuta and uh recently um th- there was um a, a breach uh, of that uh, border between Spain and Morocco, where um, basically the Moroccan border guards let the uh, African migrants uh, just swim across a really short distance mm-hmm. uh, to, into the Spanish enclave. And uh, the reason why they did that, because normally the European Union basically pays off those uh, you know, neighboring North African states. So it would be like Libya, be uh, Tunisia and Morocco. Those are the main countries, Algeria. Um, mm-hmm. And, but it's very weird. So th- there's this movement um, in the Western Sahara, which is, I guess, the Southern portion of uh, Morocco. And there's an independence movement that's going on. And uh, the independence movement leader was hospitalized in in Spain for medical treatment. Um, and that's what the Moroccan government wanted to punish uh, the Spanish on. You know, it's like, okay, so we'll just send a bunch of migrants across. So um, it, it's really like a a pressure tool. And and I know that the Turks have done something very similar, right? It's like. They basically went to the EU and said, you know, give me 6 billion euros or else uh, those uh, 3 million Syrian refugees are yours, right? Are your problem. Uh, and they already sent like about a million like in 2015, right? Um, and yeah, so I, I mean, those stories, I think they're very interesting because they tell us like what is going to happen within the next, you know, years and decades, really? Because, as you say, I mean, especially like, because like in in Latin America, I mean, like the fertility rate, I think, is at this point um, lower. Yeah, um, was not two to three. Yeah, two to three. Um, and but I mean, sub Saharan Africa. I mean, some countries are like five, six, seven. Mm-hmm. I think is the highest in Niger. So, um, yeah, if I was a European policymaker, um, I, I would be quite concerned about it. I mean, I mean, it's, it's true that a lot of the migrants, they will not go that far. You know, they'll maybe migrate to a neighboring country or something. Um, but still, I mean, if you say, okay, well, it's 2 or 3% that try to make it to Europe. Mm-hmm. But 2 or 3% of a, like, a growing number, right? So... Um. Yeah, that 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 would be somewhat uh, worrisome, and because also like you have to think about like the politics behind it. So you go back to like beginning. I think we might have, or before we started the podcast, it was about right wing populism as a as a political force, and um, and so you know ethnic. Identity, you know, politics is becoming much more salient, I would say, as the migratory pressure increases. Um, Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. But then also it's very interesting, I mean, from the electoral studies that I've seen is that, you know, the the areas that tend to vote right wing, I mean, they, they are less ethnically diverse. Uh, at least there was a study, I think, in Germany, like in the um that's true that's true but there's also a problem of facility manufacturing over here so for instance if there was a large migration to the united states where would they be placed they would be placed in urban facilities so like you'd move to say san francisco los angeles san diego or dallas austin el paso or Miami or Orlando, you would very rarely find an instance where there would be a refugee integration or a migrant invitation center in, say, 
the middle of rural Ohio or rural Massachusetts or rural Maine or even rural Texas, unless it was right on the border. This means that there's a pressure. So new immigrants typically move to urban environments and then their children and grandchildren move to the suburbs. Uh, that's the established pattern. Uh, a lot of the um, white flight got its name, uh, well, it got its name for a couple of different reasons, but one of the larger reasons for it is because the new migrants that were moving to the city were no longer strictly speaking from Europe. Uh, there were increased waves from Latin America, from Asia, and this resulted in a demographic transition. Once upon a time, Italians moved to New York and then Italians moved out into the suburbs. You don't see that very much anymore. So a lot of that pressure has to do with just how things are situated. Um, so I'm unsure how exactly that works. You seem to be grimacing about that, though. No, no, I mean, uh, I, I, you know, I, these are interesting patterns, I mean, uh, that are happening. Um, I mean, ultimately, I think the big question is about the level of um, social cohesion and that's that's very important yep. um and uh so in if you look at danish politics for instance you know um the center left party the social democratic party which has been in power for a long time mm -hmm. um they basically won the election qu quite decisively it's one of the few center left parties that does well and the reason why they could do so well is because, uh, so they, they, it, it's a mixture of like pro-welfare state mm -hmm. and anti-immigration, right? Um, because you know, pro-welfare state, okay, well, that is, it will always work, particularly working class, lower middle class, it's a mm -hmm. core base. Um, and you know, anti-immigration um, that is designed to basically keep those voters from defecting because there's, um, you know, Venstre, which is a center-right party. Um, and then also you have the far-right party, the Danish People's Party. Um, and it's really to make sure that um, the social democrat voters don't defect to those right-wing parties based off of these immigration policies. And, um, yeah, and and that, and that, that's that's been electorally very effective, and so I think you know there might be other countries. Like I mean, if you look, so I grew up in Austria, and um, you know we have this um, conservative party, the OVP, and they used to be sort of the the smaller of the of the two large parties uh, since the basically since the nineteen seventies, um, and. But then that changed about four years ago, because then they had this new leader, and it was like immediately after the uh, the migration wave of, of 15, 16. Uh, Sebastian Kurtz, he's currently the chancellor. And, you know, he, and, and he basically, well, so it was sort of like centrist, you know, slightly neoliberal on the economic policy. Um, but very hard right on on immigration policy. Um, so right now the, the the thing that they're debating um, politically is um, whether to give citizenship to um, long term residents, foreigners. Um, I think the left parties they wanted to reduce the waiting period from ten years to six years, right? And the right wing party doesn't want it, and the OVP, which is the leading government party, uh, also doesn't want it, um, because they say, "Oh, you know, people have to work hard for it to to get citizenship." You know, but it's this, yeah, but but it's sort of like the nativist ideology, which uh, does extremely well elect electorally. And yes, 
and yeah, and and, and I'm, I'm so I'm somewhat worried that like, you know, um, because you have the migratory pressures that still exist, but then it's like, no, 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 we're going to create a fortress because that's the only way how we can win elections. Um, well. <sighs> It depends on whether or not you think the market incentive will be enough to eventually overcome the fortress aspect of it. Uh, so, for instance, the European continent is seeing massive demographic pressures towards decline. Um, I think there are only a handful of countries inside of Europe that have anywhere approaching replacement level for demographics. I think France is one of them. And if I had to make a guess, I'd say that that might have something to do with the fact that France has a very large minority community that came from North Africa, particularly in the um, decolonial movement and some of the legacy movements. Um, other than that, it's it's bottoming out. Um, it, it's not as bad as in Northeast Asia or Singapore or Hong Kong or Macau, but it's, it's pretty bad and it's getting worse. So eventually Europe needs to decide whether or not it wants to fade into comfortable irrelevancy or automate the hell out of its institutions to the point where it might work like Japan or open the doors for more migration. As in, those are really the only choices unless they're able to reverse the fertility decline. So. Yeah, there was an interesting argument by uh, Matt Iglesias. Um, he's from Vox. And um, he wrote this book titled One Billion Americans. And um, so his argument is that, you know, in order to keep global supremacy, the U.S. would have to triple its population. Um, and um, so he framed it entirely in terms of the Cold War with China, right? So mm -hmm. um, because, you know, China with four times the population, of course, could, you know, it can easily overtake the U.S. without having to reach the same per capita GDP, right? Yeah, it needs to reach about third to a half. Yeah, um, and um, so th that would be so. I mean, I, and then that's the important assumption, right? So you know, should the U.S. be sort of like retain its uh, global supremacy? Uh, status um and and also given the fact that i mean if you look at our fertility numbers now i mean we're falling behind too yeah so basically up until 08 it was okay and then after that it was it just dipped downwards and then and then it just, it just kept going down right mm -hmm. um and and that's because, yeah, I mean, because people say, well, there's no economic security, right? I mean, it's like, why should I have kids? Yep. Um, and so assuming that, okay, I mean, now we saw with like the recent Biden budget, like the, you know, the the the, the child support payments, which is a new benefit. It was something like $600 or something a, a month, maybe something like that. Um, Useful. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, maybe maybe it's yeah, it's, it could be a good policy, but um, yeah, I, I I don't know whether it's gonna be sufficient. So then ultimately, you know, if if, if Iglesias wants to sort of realize his, his policy goal of, of tripling population, basically it would have to come entirely from immigration, right? Um, and that has. <sighs> I'm very sympathetic to that argument, but we need to find a way to do this without creating a political time bomb. Uh, so for instance, part of the reason why anxiety is so high now for new immigration is because local replacement is dipping further and further below. Uh, we need to find some way to have a happy medium where uh, there's something akin to demographic replacement and migration that can go into it because there is a tipping point where things become politically unstable. I forget what ratio that is, but you could just do a meta analysis on this one to see 
how, how often are political revolutions prone to happen based upon demographic pressures. So in my ideal world, about 25% to 33% of uh, the United States is not born in the US. Let's say more 25 than 33. And there's continual demographic expansion on the other side of things. Because the way to make a more cohesive overlap is that there's a population in which the new population can move into. If what you have instead is uh, that there is a large number of migrants and it seems as though the only people who are having children are migrant communities, then you see a large backlash. That seemed to be what fueled the initial backlash against Hispanics, um, from what I heard at one point. Um, overall increased anxiety about that. We need to try to find some way of making sure that things work because I want the United States to be an open country. I have a very strong belief in the idea of the American immigrants, the American open society, the American project is something that isn't delegated to blood and soil nonsense. And I think that that type of model could very easily be adapted for other countries as well. I just want to make sure that it's done in a way that doesn't create long-term pressures that would kill the project because we almost had that project die in our lifetimes. Yeah, you want gradual migration and that's definitely that, that's the current government policy. I mean, if you do issue 1 million green cards every year and then you know 500,000 maybe you know come in other ways tourists and they become undocumented overstayers. Um so you know so you add about one and a half billion people every year. Now, considering that the total stock of the U.S. population keeps going up, that means that, you know, but if you keep the new entrance constant number, it means that there's a percentage term, it will come down, right? Yep. Um, so, you know, so I, 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 think, I think the gradual assimilation is, is, is happening anyways. Yeah. And uh, so I'm not, but, but then I guess, you know, perhaps Iglesias' counterpoint would be that um, you know we can we can turn on the spigots a little bit bigger, um, and you know we, we can allow you know more immigration and uh, without sort of overwhelming the you know the carrying capacity, but because like with those issues, especially like if it's a rich country like the U.S. with a lot of resources already, I think. You know, we 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 could easily have absorbed more people. Now, the the objection would I think come from the sort of the Greta Thunbergs of the world, and and I think it would always be good to have a little bit of a Greta in all of us, <laughs> uh, where it's like because it, there's there's a worry that so. It, it's true that like we are down from the peak emissions of 1990. But we're still number one. I mean, like with a total, with a total CO two budget, right? Um, so I'm just like, okay, so yeah. I mean, even if even if we do all solar panels and only windmills, you know, I just I don't know. It it, it doesn't it doesn't sound too good to me, um, given that that every American you know um, will expect to have the standard of living that we currently have, right? True, although I'm a... I, I cut you off, sorry, keep going. Yeah, I mean, it's like, and that, 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 that's, that, that's going to be the major political debate, which I think, like the, the relationship between human and nature, I think that's the sort of, I think it's sort of the biggest conflict that um that 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 you know living in the capitalist society has given us um yeah you know, the fact that you know we that we don't have 
sort of like a, a balanced uh, view and you're know, living in moderation, you know, it's, it's sort of like our ideology is like, well, you know, the more the better. You know, because, you know, we want more jobs, you know, we want uh, more output, you know. Uh, True. Although, there are a couple of hot fixes to that that probably never happen. So, for instance, nuclear energy production is something that isn't as cheap as fossil fuels and probably won't be as cheap as green energy in the future. But it's probably the one non environmentally determinant resource that we can use that is quote unquote renewable. And we have found ways to utilize nuclear energy with very little waste, as in there are ways to discard the waste that wouldn't even necessarily matter or make any bit of difference. We've long since passed Chernobyl level disasters, and we no longer need to just shove all of our nuclear waste into Cheyenne Mountain, or was it a mountain near Cheyenne? I forget which. As in, we don't need that anymore. So it is possible to make that type of energy production. It's just that it's more expensive. So at a certain point, can we subsidize that or can we afford the trade-off? Because yeah. it's something we could do. Well, there was a book by Charles uh, Perrault. He's one of the major organization sociologists. And uh, he wrote a book about the Three Mile Island, um, which was a nuclear plant in Pennsylvania. And um, there was a big accident, and I think it was in 1979. And um, if you look at the, you could say nuclear energy as a percentage of total energy production, uh, it's been fairly stagnant. I think it's like 15 percent or something like that. Um, you know, probably since that uh, Three Mile Island incident, and. Um, and and I I don't see a lot of new um, nuclear reactors being commissioned. I mean, in fact, I mean, whenever they were shutting down one, like it's not they're not opening up new ones. So, um, I, so I I I don't know how important it is as part of the energy strategy. And also, if you look at countries like Germany, for instance, where you know, they operated, I think, seven or eight uh, nuclear reactors until Fukushima happened. And then uh, and then they said, ah, well, you know, this is too dangerous. We can't do that. Um, and so they, so they shut and down. And then they do yeah. what? They make the Nord Stream pipeline? <laughs> yeah, well, so now it's like, yeah, coal and gas. That's a that's, that's no. German strategy. I mean, but but to be fair to them, like, they also... Like they also ramped up the investment on the on the solar and wind, so uh, so they are they are trying to make that transition to the to the renewable sector. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, if you look at the short term CO two budget, um, yeah, it, it doesn't look good because because obviously like because also like if you don't do transition time, like if you say hey today we're gonna shut down that uh, nuclear reactor, and then it's like. Well, but we still need this amount of energy. So then they're like, okay, well, let's turn on the, the brown coal, you know, the black coal uh, plants, and uh, yeah, let's do the North Stream and pipe. I guess there's like three pipelines now that's connecting the Russia with Germany. Um, so, I mean, it, it's yeah. I mean, there, there has to be there has to be some intelligent planning. I guess would be the point, and. Um, so I my stance on nuclear energy is like it's not it's it's not clear opposition, but it's also not enthusiasm, right? It's like I I would never go out and say, hey, you know, this this is gonna solve all of our problems. Now I mean I debate another friend of mine, uh Steve Wong, he's like a neoliberal friend of mine. <laughs> and for him it's like, you know, nuclear is a solution to everything. Um and but but even that mindset is already very very concerning to me, right? <laughs> like uh, it's like that the, the neoliberal always has like a simple solution, and uh, you know we can. It's been a while since I heard of Steve. Um, 
well, we, we, we still debate with each other, but uh, over, over uh, chat, basically. Not, not... So nuclear, I wouldn't name as a panacea to all of our world's problems, but I would put it as a very important intermediary step. So for instance, in the transition to more renewable forms of green technology, and there are ways to go about this that are kind of unique and innovative that we would never be able to do on a very large scale because America is too big of a country, but smaller countries can definitely do. So Iceland is investigating hydro, as in um, creating hydroelectricity that's not from rivers, but from uh, combining it with oxygen to create water, as in perfectly green technology. Uh, we used to have hydro powered cars as some type of thing that we might do before we gave up that for electric cars. That's a solution that could work very well in certain locations. For instance, wind might work exceptionally well in the Netherlands because of the offshore platforming onto the ocean for generation there, but makes less sense in other parts of the country, um, other parts of the European continent. Nuclear power has the virtue of being able to be deployed anywhere um, for almost any purpose for energy production. You don't need to worry about long-term uh, photosensitivity or local albedo conditions in order to ensure you're generating the adequate amount of solar power. You don't need to worry about whether or not a drought will dramatically decrease your amount of hydropower that you can generate. You don't need to worry that you might not have the right wind patterns to generate wind energy nearly as well. Right, because it's chemical reactions inside the plant that uh, yeah. produce the energy. Yeah, it's uniform. It doesn't really matter where you go. You just need a platform and you just need to make sure that it's efficient. That is a very seductive thing as an intermediary step. It does have drawbacks. It is expensive. It does still have waste, even if we can dramatically reduce the waste. And it's also unpopular. So for instance, if nuclear energy was as cheap as gas and coal, there'd be plants all over the United States with it because we have been focusing towards a more cheap form of energy production. But it isn't. But if we were to say, have a very serious Greta Thunberg moment, as we wait for other technologies to reach the level where you can see broadband applicability everywhere in a way that's useful, like battery technologies working to the point where you can save enough energy that you could then distribute it without having a fail safe of a coal or a oil type energy production. Nuclear is probably the way to do it. And Maybe we could see a peak if we were serious about investing in some type of green energy revolution of about 50 to 60% nuclear. And then it would just fade away as the cheaper forms gradually replace it and old plants aren't replaced. I think that's eminently doable. I think that's something that would be very useful and worthwhile. Right. So you see nuclear energy as a, as a stopgap measure, right? Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that that that's a position that I would support as well, right? I mean, because like, I mean, so for us, I mean, of course, you know, we debate this issue very abstractly, textbook style. But then, like, I mean, if you're like a resident in Fukushima in Japan, you know, you're like, well, okay, you know, that th that water is undrinkable for you know whatever the next generation or something like that. Um, Maybe some residents are trying to move back in again and trying to rebuild, mm -hmm. but they're still very unsure about it. I mean, I mean, the still Chernobyl too, which might even be a better example. Like you can't live there, right? So, I I, I would just be worried that because I mean, of course, like if if you're like a like a bentamind utilitarian and you say, hey, you know, all that matters is, you know that overall utility in society has increased, um, which presumably it would. And then, yeah, maybe, you know, if there's like a tornado, thunderstorm, whatever, that, you know, that can, um, transforms one, you know, village into like a wasteland. Um, 
that that will be okay, you know. And I, 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 I would still, I would still be troubled to, like, even even if the Bentamide assumption was true, um, mm. and of course, you know, we know that Bentham was a sociopath. Um, just his uh, his ideology, G two, it's like fellow man, fellow humans. Um, on Jeremy. Yep. Yeah. Um, I I I I would still be very s- skeptical of that. Um, you know, of of, of you of applying. Of sure. Applying sure. I, I understand that type of skepticism. So an easy way to go about this would be to ensure that the energy production is not in a location whereby natural disasters can conceivably occur in such a way that it would fundamentally create a disaster or that there are safeguards put in place that were not considered prior to increased awareness about environmental safeguards. For instance, don't build a nuclear power plant next to an urban environment on an earthquake fault line. Don't build it next to an earthquake fault line on the ocean so that you could potentially have tsunamis or potentially have some type of earthquake that breaks it then yeah, it but where would you the ocean it and then spreads into everywhere. So you could move it inland like 50 miles away, as in such that if there's a local breakdown, it wouldn't have as much of a immediate impact to people who were living in the area. And it doesn't have as immediate access to ways to contaminate or radiate outward. So for instance, if you wanted to put one in California, maybe perhaps you'd want to avoid the San Andreas fault line. You wouldn't want it to be too close to the ocean so that there would be minimal risk of contamination in case things break. So you would instead want to put it further inland, maybe not as close to a mountain range or a volcano, not as close to a fault line, maybe in the desert. So there's a very large amount of desert inside of southeastern California. And you can just make a bunch of them and then rig them up with connection wires, um, different ways to transport electricity across through the various conductivity pathways, power generated plants. You can even put them into batteries and ship them around if you're going to use the battery model that we're developing for green energy anyways. So that, that would be a way to immediately prevent never again a Fukushima, because Fukushima was not ideally placed to prevent environmental disaster. If anything, that seems like, oh, we're in Fukushima, we want to have a local area that's very proud, have all of our workers have very easy access to it. And because we're on the shore, very easy access to the ocean and then recipe for disaster. Like I would have put it next to New York City, for instance, or put it in the shadow of LA, as in that would not be a place where I think a nuclear reactor should go. But maybe... 50 miles away from Austin in Texas would be a good place to put it. Maybe in a rural part of the hill country in Georgia would be a good place to put it. I probably wouldn't put one in Florida because of low water tables, but that's why it's 50 or 60% of total power generation. You're not going to feed everything. Well, so I think it's this, you know, nuclear energy is an example for, you know, risk society. I mean, you know, there might, there's always going to be some residual risk. I mean, sure. even the sort of like, there will always be risk. Yeah. So the green technology that we are praising. Um, um, so, you know, if you look at uh, uh, Biden's new energy plan where he says, you know, we want to have full uh, electric vehicle mm-hmm. conversion by, I think, mid century at the latest or something. Um, and, and, and it sounds really good again, right? Because you're like, hey, you know, th- there's there's no exhaust fumes coming out of electric vehicles. Um, but what? but yeah, so there's two problems. I mean, the first is of course your overall energy grid. You know, is that clean? Mm-hmm. Because you know, as you as you mentioned with Texas, where there's a lot of it comes uh, from uh, from oil and gas. The answer is obviously no. And then the second problem that I now identified uh, is there was this documentary I was watching in, um, so like the, the source of the uh, of the lithium battery. So you have to extract the lithium from mines. Um, and so they they go to to South America, to like, you know, Chile and uh, 
uh, B uh, Bolivia and uh, Peru, I think that that area. Uh, the Andes. Uh, yeah, and 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 then it's like, and then you have a problem. So, okay, so wh so where are the mines located? So they, um, it's it's gonna be in areas where the indigenous people live, essentially, right? Because they tend to be in more rural areas, um, and. Yeah, and then there's going to be struggles, you know, between basically the mine owners, uh, the corporations, uh, and uh, and the local residents. Definitely. And, uh, and they're sort of concerned, hey, you know, you're stealing our land, and then also you, you know, dirty up the groundwater, right? Um, so I was just thinking to myself, I mean, even the stuff that we think is going to be a solution, I mean, it is generating new problems, you know? Um, you know. Definitely. Um, so related to that, there's an interesting fun fact. Rare earth minerals or rare earth metals are most commonly produced inside of China. That's not necessarily because that's where most of it is. It's just because we wouldn't want to do that type of extraction in the Rocky Mountains, for instance, because it's very messy, very cost intensive and environmental preservation. Yeah. So, for instance, most of our national parks are in that area. Most of our federal reserve, most of our reserve lands are there. Most of the American native. Um, Get exactly what we would call them. The old term was dependencies, but the reservation system is there for them as well. For instance, when we had a pipeline going from Canada down to Texas, I forget what it was called. Was it the Keystone Pipeline? Uh, there was a lot of problems because it was just traveling over land, over Indian land. In the western part of the United States, there's a high concentration of land that has extra scrutiny and extra protection. And then you have California, which has even stronger environmental regulations. Um, Oregon and Washington also have pretty strong environmental regulations. So we have a lot of rare earth metals that we could find or use, but we're never going to do it because we have our own safeguards in place. So lithium extraction will go elsewhere. Most of our technological extraction will go elsewhere, which definitely creates some mixed feelings uh, on my account. So for instance, that is very much a clear example of, we don't want to wreck our stuff, but we still want it. So we'll buy it from you. So you wreck it yourselves. And it's just like, no, I okay. saw this vice documentary recently. I think it was in the state of Utah mm -hmm. where th that that's what they're doing. I mean, they're creating a lithium mine, you know? Uh, yeah. so, so there's some idea about, Hey, you know, let's do domestic sourcing of the raw material and uh, you know we have especially you know during the pandemic you know suddenly companies realized that uh, global supply chains aren't as reliable so they're like oh, okay you know let's try it over here yep and um but then you, you're gonna have the same things i mean it's like because you're always going to create the mine close to some village some town right uh people and live like, everywhere yeah, they, 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 there's nimbyism. I mean, everybody's got nimbyism. Um, now, I mean, of course, in, in, in China, it doesn't matter as much because, you know, basically the government owns everything <laughs> and, and there's no democracy anyway. So it's like, ah, okay, yeah. you know, we'll just do whatever we want. Anything you own is just leased from the People's Republic of China for 99 years. That's it. As in anything you own, it's leased for 99 years. <laughs> like, okay, we expect you to die before you return it, but... It's ours. <laughs> yeah, I mean the efficiency of it is 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 just amazing, though. It's like because I I because I wrote the high speed rail a couple of years ago, and of course, because you were in Beijing too. I mean, a couple of years yeah. back, right? So he must have experienced that too. And I, I, I was just I mean I, I was just amazed by it. It was like you just go in, you know, scan the ticket, and then you know, uh, yep. Five hours later, you know, you were in Shanghai when you started in Beijing. Yeah, even their metro systems are very good. Like if you go to the Beijing metro system, it is a thing to behold. 
Yeah, because the, the systems are very new, and I think that's what makes yep. it. Um, that's true. What makes it good? I mean, and you know, they just they can just go to uh, the countries that have the best technology. Um, so, for the high speed rail, I mean, like J Japan, France, Germany, which are the world leaders in uh, in that category. Um, they sort of incorporated those technologies and. And then it just works very efficiently. And then so, and so when, when in California they were trying to do something similar, it's like a really short train track, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, and but they couldn't get it started because because of these lawsuits that are happening, right? It's like eh, you know we want to reuse that piece of land, but it goes through your property, and then the property owners are like, you know, fuck you, I'm not going to give you anything. So. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's the thing about like, you know, so, you know, the protection individual rights uh, versus precisely this like bent in my utilitarian thinking, you know, uh, um, where like, you know, societal benefit just matters much more. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it is, it is, it is ultimately the, the major trade-off um but in this like cold war that is sort of like you know heating up somewhat now um i mean do, 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 do you see that this is like a stock contrast of like okay you know this is like the liberal side that's that that's opposing the authoritarian side and you know we have to basically back uh you know one side uh in, in in this in this competition so there is certain benefits there are certain benefits to the authoritarian system for sheer production stuff so there's no internal debate process things happen and they just happen and you have to deal with them but just because there are benefits to that type of system doesn't mean that they are in any way enviable so for instance Xi Jinping, prior to one of the big meetups of the Politburo, decided that the coal would be turned off for certain parts of Beijing and slum, not slum areas, but migrant areas where people didn't have adequate hukos were kicked out. As in, there were very large numbers of people that were just cleared out, and anyone that stayed behind had no power and no water. As in, it was just shut off, like a switch. Uh, do you know what happened to, to them? I mean, were they relocated to... Uh, Some of them were relocated. I mean, of course, they had their own hukos and not... And these weren't exactly the most destitute of people. But there, were a lot, there was a lot of hardship that resulted of this. And I can't tell you too much about it because the system also has a complete blackout of information. As in, there was some early covering of it and then that just stopped. To the point that it was just rumors on the street, which are notorious for not being trustworthy. But it does give China a certain conspiratorial bent. Like if you're in China, there's a very strong conspiratorial bent of uh, things that people don't have adequate information towards or think that they're being given a certain lie to. They will create sometimes pretty fantastic and fantasy stories. It does mean that they're more prone to believing some rather problematic things with regards towards the United States, but that doesn't really right, matter. Right, for instance, that the U.S. military was behind the uh, COVID. Uh, they brought it yep. to Wuhan. Yep. Or <laughs> that is that is one of them. Uh, a lot of... Some of them are pretty damn insidious and disgusting, but that's probably the most overt example of stupidity because... Not stupidity, but conspiratorial thinking because around the same time we were actively considering whether or not it was the result of a lab leak inside of Wuhan. Uh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology could have been doing something and it might've just went out. And no one thought, or very few people thought that it was a malicious action, even if it was a lab leak. But the very idea that that might happen kicked in an immediate response that had this undercurrent of conspiratorial thinking. And then once that happened, 
this was a very useful type of sentiment in the population for the CCP. So they just amplified the hell out of it. They had some junior ranking members of their government say it out loud. And that's always the funny thing about authoritarian regimes. Everyone likes to think that they're a mess of different factions competing for one another, whereas it's actually more so you keep some people who are very liberal, you keep some people who are very hardliners, and whenever the people on top are dissatisfied with something, they'll let the hardliners say more stuff, and whenever the people on top are very happy with something, they'll let the reformers say some things, and it's a way to play not just themselves, but foreign media understandings of what's going on. That's the, the fundamental tension in comparative politics, if you ever go into that type of discipline, where everything is a faction and everything has a reaction, and they know how to game that too, which is just kind of funny. But yeah, there are certain benefits to the authoritarian model. It's just that those benefits are not necessarily things that we should find enviable. So for instance, yeah, I would love for us to have high speed rail everywhere. I would love for us to have the ability to fundamentally reshape society in a very quick notion because we have a lot of legacy systems and the legacy systems aren't being updated and there's no real political will to change that. And you're throwing in a lot of money after depreciated systems so that if we were actually able to use our money smartly and we weren't spending so much on repairs, we would have a very large pot to deal with other things because we're dealing with a depreciated society with no real no real engine to generate new and novelty. Instead, it's just continual repairs on the same highways that almost never get wider, that almost never get improved, with buildings that are getting older by the decade, and all of the new construction is highlighted in certain areas. And it's a recipe for long-term problems. Not necessarily disasters, but problems. But we do need to find a way to mitigate those risks. So just because China is able to build glittering metropolises in 20 years that no one lives in doesn't necessarily mean that we should feel like we need to alter our system or change who we are or disrespect the rights and property and liberties and identities of our own citizens. We do need to find a way to make eminent domain work so that we can redo our infrastructure. We do need to find a way to make sure that our infrastructure is smarter and isn't collapsing around us. Uh, critical infrastructure investment and development and redesign is probably not now going to be important, but 2030s, 2040s, 2050s, that will probably be the fundamental dem uh, domestic issue, as in that and cyber infrastructure and information resilience, probably, if I had to make a guess. But yeah, there's that tension there. There are people who are championing either model, but I think that we can do it smart without looking too closely at a system that we probably shouldn't be looking at with too much admiration. Yeah, I mean, just on the, this public transit issue, I mean, you know, just recently going going to Philadelphia, you, uh, you have to take have to take two public transit trains. And because it's if you go on a Sunday schedule, you have one train every two hours. Mm -hmm. So that means that so I was so when I went there to the train station and I was stuck there for over an hour and a half just to wait for the next train. I, I, I that, that was quite excessive, I would say. I mean, um, because presumably why, you know, oh, you know, there's not much demand in that time or something. Um, but you know, in the European countries, I mean, because I, because I must assume like they subsidize the system much better from public funds mm -hmm. so that, um, you know, yeah, if you, if you, if you live in a very outlying area, maybe, you know, once an hour or something, but, um, but especially the closer down you go to Vienna, for instance, you know, every five, six minutes, I mean, you definitely, there's definitely some, you know, either bus or uh, trolley or something like that. So, um, it's a much better system, and 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 then I think it would also change incentives because people would say, ah, you know, maybe you know, we don't really need a car, you know, it's a, just 
up on the public transit, you know, and um, you have a really reliable, uh, the high-speed rail would be a big one, um, so that actually it, 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 would, it would relieve the housing pressure substantially. Uh, and that's one of the issues where Steve Wong and I actually, okay, this might be some agreement here, rarely. Uh, it's like, okay, well, build a build, build good public transit system. And then, um, because r right now, I mean, going back to this like urban economy agglomeration effect, right? You know, where a lot of people want to work in the same place. They also want to live close by where they work. So then the rental prices, property price just goes through the roof. So I'm like, well, okay, if you build really good public transit systems, which means, you know, you can live a little bit further away from your workplace. Um, and where you live, there would be less rental, pre uh, you know, pressure on, on demand. So there'd be a lower rental price. You know, uh, this, and then you know, even if you factor in the commuting costs, I mean, if you again, if you if you subsidize a public transit system, you know, you can I don't know fifty dollars maybe a monthly ticket, you know, and this is like you know two restaurant visits, right? So yeah, that would be very affordable. So um, yeah, I mean that that would be I mean that would be one way how you could uh, yeah how how you could restructure the urban economies i think it would be much better i mean but on this point of like authoritarianism yeah i think um yeah i i have debates with like friends of china and you know about it's oftentimes it's about the virtues and vices of each system you know and and i always like to say that you know so in a democratic system, I mean, I, I know that there's a lot of shortcomings. I mean, we can have crazy leaders. We can have people like Trump, for instance. Um, you know, Hitler was a democratically elected leader, right? It's the most extreme example. Um, so I would say that in a democracy, you know, you, you don't have the right to vote for good leaders. But you have the right to get rid of bad leaders. And I think that's the... That, that that's the biggest benefit I would think for in the democratic system where it's like because so, so you know like in Confucian ethics right um, um, there's this idea of mandate of heaven right where it's like I mean as, as long as the king you know the leader of the CCP I guess today um, is is doing what the people want then you know he should rule basically for the rest of his life and his children as well. Um, if he screws up too much, mandate of heaven is withdrawn, which which usually means there's some rebellion, you know, a peasant rebellion or something, um, some civil war, and then and then you put in a new leader. And yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, maybe I'm a little bit too wimpy, having lived in the West, where I'm like. You know, is is there a way to not use the guns and uh, still do, you know, a uh, uh, transition of power? You know, uh, so uh, so that, that that to me, I think, was the most endearing factor about uh, the mock democratic systems. I mean, even you know, even with 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 the flaw of you know putting in charge bad leaders, right? Yeah. So in that circumstance, if you don't have guns then the only way that you win is by damaging the will of your opposition to use theirs. Uh, so for instance, the shadow of Tiananmen looms large over China. And the question is whether or not the military would ever engage in something like that again. If they do, uh, then there's no way to have a transition in power that is nonviolent, as in because at that point it can just be crushed. And I think you see certain elements of this inside of Hong Kong. So there was a co-option of the local police. There was large stationing of troops around Hong Kong. And this did one thing really, really well. Namely, they 
impressed upon the local leaders in Hong Kong that if you want to keep your system, if you want to keep us out, you need to, in effect, become willing collaborators with us. So the decline in Hong Kong democracy is one in which the current democratic leaders inside of Hong Kong are willingly giving up some of their rights and prerogatives. Well, they were barred from running candidates, right? Yeah, to prevent from to prevent an even worse outcome. So this is risk aversion at its finest. It is the cowardice of certain forms of institutional leadership. And the really terrifying thing is, I'm not even entirely sure how much I can criticize them for it, because if they did go gung ho in resistance, and the tanks did go marching down Hong Kong streets, what would have been done about it in, say, here? In Australia, in India, in the ASEAN countries, in Japan, in South Korea, I'm unsure that there would have been the needed type of outrage to prevent a complete victory on the part of Beijing, because we had an opportunity to do substantially greater transformative influences inside of China in the wake of Tiananmen. As in, there was a time when we could have asked for almost anything and it would have happened. That's gone. Now it's unsure that even if we were united in rage and we tried our best to do certain forms of activities to prevent some of the worst outcomes, it's unclear that that would even happen. As in right now, it's even unclear whether or not we have the ability to effectively defend Taiwan. So for instance, I'm not sure if you're into the modern security literature, but there is an increased skepticism about the ability of the United States to provide an effective security blanket to Taiwan in the 2020s and 2030s. As in late 2020s, early 2030s, there's a growing fear of a transition where China might take action and we're unclear that we can even do it, in large part because of anti-axis area denial expansion, uh, People's Liberation Naval expansion, the fact that they have nuclear weapons and can destroy half of the world if they want to. They don't have earth ending capabilities yet, but they have continent ending capabilities. And they are building more nuclear weapons because for some reason they might think that if they can't destroy the world, someone might try to risk something. No, no one will, but that's that's a growing development there too, which means the democratic systems that are most vulnerable to the authoritarian pressures of Beijing might find themselves inclined to make compromises. And I don't, I don't know what to do about that. I'm not sure what the solution to that is, because how do we protect or safeguard Hong Kong or Macau, uh, Xiangang, Almond. I'm not sure how we can do it. Well, Macau, sure we I think, it. was always a slightly different story because, um, you know, the Communist Party had sort of like long-term sure. connections with uh, the local officials there for, you know, decades even before the handover. So I think yeah, less of a independent political culture yeah. You know, also, like you know, the, the you know the Portuguese colonizers, because also you have to consider that Portugal you know, used to be a dictatorship, I think, until the 1970s or so. So, yeah. I don't think that they would be sort of the model for like liberal democratic capitalism the way the British were. Yeah. Um, and um, so, so Hong Kong would be the main uh, concern and. Yeah, it, yeah. The, 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 I mean, at this point, there's no way out for them. I think you know, um, you know, they 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 were going to be uh, crushed. Now, in terms of the economic fallout of it, I mean, if you look at the data there, it's definitely the case that like Western um, companies are sort of drawing out the headquarters. They're you know sort of starting to move to Singapore, you know, as a way to uh, keep the foothold in Asia, um, but but Hong Kong economically is not declining necessarily because it's very interesting is that is that the mainland companies are coming in right so they're 
they're sort of taking a, so like the office space that the western companies are selling that's what the chinese yeah. the mainland companies are acquiring so um and and there's still something like for if you're like a mainlander there's something very attractive about about hong kong where you know like you know because the institutions still work very efficiently effectively there's still mm -hmm. some some ties to western companies uh, so, you know with the western world so uh you know still like, a lot of greater freedoms so yeah there's still some freedoms like, so like a if they went from a 90 on freedom to 80 or 70, that's still much higher than 20 or 30 down in mainland China. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so to that extent, I mean, so then, yeah, then over time, what you're seeing is, is a mainlandification of the, of Hong Kong. I mean, to the extent that, yep. you know, um, yeah, within a generation or two, I don't think that, they would see themselves as separate from, you know, Shenzhen or, you know, other, other Chinese cities. Um, but maybe, maybe, you know, some who would like to study history, they, they might look at that. Yeah. I think that's definitely the plan. I will say that there's a small amount of pushback to that. Well, I shouldn't say small. If you take a look at primary identification for Hong Kong residents, the number of young people who say that they're Hong Kong is just, skyrocketing upwards uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean what i hope it means or what anyone not necessarily hope I, that, that's not really the right word that's really not the right word but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be that type of identification because as you said with mainlandization you could just have more people move to hong kong hong kong doesn't have the same type of setup so that migrants from the mainland might end up becoming half of the population of Hong Kong. And at that point, it doesn't matter if identification is down 30% because you have an increase, an artificial increase of virtually 100% from the mainland. So, yeah, so trade-offs. I mean, that, that's that been, you know, long running Chinese policy. I mean, if you look at what they did in Xinjiang, I mean, yep. um, I would say it's about... 40% Han Chinese um, and, you know, it's just slightly more uh, Uyghur. Um, mm. So, I mean, I mean, if you look at the British, for instance, I mean, you know, there's like a category of so-called Scots-Irish. So those are people taken from Scotland and they were settled in in Ireland. So I guess mostly in Northern Ireland, um, which Ulster. is, yeah, yeah, the Ulster. Um, and um yeah and the whole point was like well you know we bring more of our own people so that eventually yeah this is a, that this land belongs to us and uh i guess it's worked to some extent yeah i mean uh uh yeah and yeah i i don't know i mean it's a, I guess, you know, the question is, what is the goal, right? So, you know, of course, if you said, well, you know, the goal must be we have to preserve democracy, freedom in, in Hong Kong as long as we can. Um, or is the goal to, you know, basically remove Hong Kong as a as a sticking point in, you know, in, in China and really in Chinese relations with the world, right? Um, uh so, yeah, from the, from the mainland perspective, it's like, yeah, okay, we, we want to transform the city into just like any other city um, in China. And, uh, yeah, and, and I, I would certainly agree that, I mean, they, they're definitely succeeding in that. Uh, I mean, at, at the moment, I mean, I can see that they're succeeding in that path. Um, with what's happening with Taiwan, I mean, I'm not exactly uh, sure there. I mean... There are some worrying signs about, you know, the uh, naval exercises, you know, the airplanes going into Taiwanese space. Um, but I, th I, th I still think like Taiwan is a, is a much higher threshold to clear, right? Because the U.S. can always send a carrier into the Taiwan Strait, right? 
and they're like, oh, okay, you know, do we want to accidentally bomb a U.S. ship? It's like, is it worthwhile? I, you know, so. So that used to be a very comforting idea. It's increasingly less comfortable all the time, in large part because I think that whether or not to blow up an American aircraft carrier has implications to it that are very bad, very escalatory. But there might be some people in Beijing that think that if the United States sticks an aircraft carrier in the middle of the Taiwan Strait, but doesn't fire on a Chinese vessel or a Chinese plane going into Taiwan, who cares? And if they do, then they can say that they're acting in self-defense, which is a very interesting problem to be in. And then we also need to deal with the fact that the aircraft carriers are far more vulnerable now than they've ever been before. So for instance, an aircraft carrier has no real expectation of survival on the Taiwan Strait, not if there are active hostilities. Um, this seems new to you. I'm, I'm seeing you squint a little bit. Let's just say that the military advantage that the United States enjoyed over China isn't gone, but the gap went from heaven and earth to much closer. Well, also the, the, the Chinese are building their own aircraft carriers too, right? So Yeah, uh, there's a, even a question about whether or not you even want to build an aircraft carrier. Aircraft carriers are expensive. They require a large amount of people to crew them. They take a very long time to produce, and they are now much, much easier to sink. So with the development of hypersonic missile technology and the ability to more accurately pinpoint them through their own GPS system called the Beidou constellation, then yeah, it is... is... Right, so you're referring here to military technology, but I think, you know, with the aircraft carrier, I mean... I thought like the whole objective was symbolism. Yeah, symbolism. A show of force, essentially. It's like, hey, you know, look how strong we are and stuff. And you know, look at well, this big ship, you know. True. Like, like, like a big penis almost, right? And, and... I, I mean, yeah. But the thing is that symbolism only really has the same impact if it's against a nation that doesn't have the ability to provide its own symbolic gesture in return. So China has no real fear of American presence. So we've been going up and down the South China Sea now since the moment there was the first atoll that was turned into a military base. China hasn't stopped building islands. China hasn't stopped building military bases. China hasn't stopped its Coast Guard. China hasn't stopped its expansion of fishermen. And it runs its own naval exercises in the South China Sea. Presence in the South China Sea makes us feel better, makes our allies feel better, but thus far, it has had only very limited deterrent capabilities against China, which is part of the reason the Philippines didn't completely defect from us, but mostly defected from us. They lost confidence in the United States' ability to actively deter China. So they said, OK, we'll buddy up with Xi Jinping, with Rodrigo Duterte. And then when they found out that being a sycophant didn't exactly get them what they wanted, they started saying, you know what, America, stick around. But this dynamic isn't as secure as you might think, in large part because it rests on older ideas of deterrence. And I'm unsure that that old idea is going to survive because China might make the calculation that the United States won't go to war over Taiwan, it won't risk nuclear exchange, so, so long as their ships are inside of the middle of the Taiwan Strait, who cares so long as they don't actively interfere or actively intercept, uh, maybe they'll mildly inconvenience us, uh, mildly inconvenience Beijing. And if that doesn't work out, then assume they do do something stupid, um, what they would think is stupid, I'm red teaming Beijing right now, uh, then they would have some type of tit for tat approach and if that doesn't work out, then they might just sink one. Just say, stick around and we'll sink the rest. And then the ball's kicked over into Washington, D.C.'s court. Do you then send over all of the planes and all of the aircraft carriers and risk a war that could very well go nuclear 
over Taiwan. And I think that Beijing is thinking that's increasingly unlikely. I'm completely unsure. I think it will depend on who's in the White House. I think it will depend on how, how Congress is going to behave. And I think that we are very close to some very unsettling types of developments, which is why there's this growing fear that the end of the 2020s and the early 2030s might be a potential hostile takeover of Taiwan. Right now, the most we can really do as effective deterrence is just continually sell them more and more sophisticated missile technology, missile defense technology, offensive military capabilities, ships, planes, to make Taiwan into a virtual fortress. And if that doesn't work, who knows? I know where my sympathies are, but just because I have sympathies towards it doesn't mean it will happen. Yeah, it's 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 a rough thing. I mean, I, I uh, like a couple of years ago, so it was before the the twenty nineteen Hong Kong protests. I spoke with a Hong Kong resident, and and she was like very adamant, like you know, we need the U.S. to come save Hong Kong democracy and things like that. And and I was sort of unconvinced because not because I didn't have sympathy for Hong Kong people, but rather because a US China World War Three, you know, that as a possible outcome for the sake of saving, you know, Hong Kong, you know, seven, eight million people. I I, I just found it to be disproportionate. You know, it's like it's um and now the the now, if if I had if I was speaking with a Taiwanese activist today, you know, you know, making the same claim is like you know the U.S. has to throw everything that they have uh, to protect us. I mean, of course, it's 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 one issue where you said selling weapons, um, which is still very passive, where you could still say, oh, you know, here's the weapons and good luck. Um, and, but the other is like like a full scale military support and, you know, like in the Korean war, for instance, or Vietnam war. Um, yeah, I think it's totally different magnitude and, and I, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't be a good politician or leader on the U S side, but I would just, I would blink on that one as well. It's like, you know, would we be fighting world war three over, over Taiwan, I, just, no, I, I don't know whether that's that Taiwan seems country. to be the way that modern great power competition is evolving. So, for instance, China is paying very close attention to the way that nations act and react, not just to its own actions, but to say the actions of Russia or Iran. So, Russia annexed the Crimea. Russia engaged in a civil war, irregular conflict where it was dumping volunteers into Donetsk and Luhansk. What did we do? Um, we sold Ukraine guns. We said no, no, no to Russia. We put a lot of strong sanctions on them, which is the solution to every foreign policy problem. If a foreign policy problem doesn't have a sanction behind them, then you know it's not a real problem. But that doesn't mean it's going to do anything. And then, what, two years later, three years later, Germany, the leader of the European Union, essentially, one of our strongest partners in the world, a key NATO member. Yeah, we aren't going to stop the Nord Stream pipeline. I, I mean, we're sympathetic to Ukraine, but they are never going to join the European Union. They're not a member of NATO. Who cares, essentially? This resurgent realpolitik that completely undermines their more liberal bent that they try to present themselves as. And then you have France that is even less committal about going to support Ukraine. And then you have the populist contingent, which is the most popular it's ever been, mostly in Central and Eastern Europe. And they are sort of okay with Putin. Really, the largest opposition to this is being driven by Poland, and that's just because Poland's close enough that they worry, and the Baltic countries, because they have very large Russian minorities, and they are concerned that Russia might do the same thing to them as Russia did to Ukraine. 
this is a type of foreign policy that is built around salami tactics work. So China does some things in Hong Kong, no one acts. China does some things in Xinjiang, no one acts. China goes around and conducts naval exercises, no one asks. China builds militarized platforms inside of the South China Sea that are built off of sand and will last for as long as they want them to, to do power to projection and no one really acts. And you just see this continual buildup and the pressure builds. Well, I mean, the thing is also builds. like, you know, with foreign relations, I mean, there's no objective criteria. That is to say, there's no red line that, you know, we could all universally agree on, right? Yep, right. that's the problem of deterrence. So how do we establish a red line? What is the red line? Is the red line an invasion of Taiwan? Or do we consider that still a Chinese internal issue because there is only one China policy and that China is Beijing. The well, province uh, of Taiwan uh, is a United renegade Nations breakaway state. Yeah, renegade breakaway state. Uh, that is what we conceded in the 1970s. So is trying to take over your own country considered illegal now? Right, it would be like, you know, if, so you know, in, in Hawaii there used to be this uh, queen uh, with a really long name, yep. uh, uh, and um, you know, it, it, imagine that queen was still in power today. It would be like, well, you know, if we send uh, the aircraft carriers to basically bomb the shit out of, uh, you know, uh, Hawaii Island, um, you know, sh should there be U uh, UN sanctions against the U.S. Right? That's the thing. Um, Not only that, but. China has veto power in the UN. It's a permanent member of the Security Council. That's dead. China would never, uh, Russia would never sign off on it anyway. So that's dead. Uh, the UN Security Council is effectively paralyzed in great power competition because it's weaponized against itself. It's like the Cold War again. So this is a very tricky, sticky issue. And of course, there's the problem of establishing deterrence. We've had cyber attacks against US infrastructure, like four or five of them this year. Uh, a lot of it is connected to ransomware for hospitals that is related to Russian groups and outlets operating in Eastern Europe. We've had attacks on our main energy distribution platform inside of the Southeastern United States in the form of a pipeline shutting down. We've had our meat packaging supplies have a lot of damage done to them. There's a lot of vulnerabilities in our infrastructure that are increasingly exploited. And most of the, the preponderance of evidence suggests that it's Russia. The problem is in the cyber domain, it's very difficult to establish. Uh, it's very difficult to establish who the actor is. You can isolate things like language, common operating hours, things in the code that's very useful. Um, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of things that go into it that makes it very possible for us to do it. But in the end of the day, it's always probabilistic. You don't have the missile shooting up, arcing over, falling down and blowing up. You just have an exploit that is exploited. And unless you have very specific things going on, you'll be able to know with some reasonable expectation of confidence who did it, but you'll never know for sure, which is why Russia can just say, wasn't us. And there are idiots that will believe them because no matter how much evidence we pile on, it's all going to be like, you don't know if that's enough evidence, which irritates me sometimes. But yeah, we are already being attacked. We already have our infrastructure being undermined. We already have similar things going on in Europe. We've had corporate espionage from China for decades now. Everyone's private information is essentially owned four times over by Beijing and three times over by Russia. We have failed to establish red lines. And this isn't a Republican or a Democrat issue. Neither type of party has done so. And if anything, the common divides that we have between Republicans and Democrats are going to make it that much harder to ensure consistent policy. Yeah, Everything I mean, has fallen to a point where establishing deterrence is tough, and I'm not sure we'll be able to do it in an effective way, which means that 
if we aren't even able to protect ourselves, to what extent can we give a guarantee to protect others? Yeah, I, I think, you know, this is the issue with, you know, risk society overall that we live in. I mean, I guess the cyber attacks uh, is a clear application of that, where it's like, because, I mean, if you think about, like, what could be the origin of the the cyber attacks well it's the fact that you know the internet and uh, you know networks uh, computers is such an important part of the way how we structure our society you know like if we apply for benefits or if you apply for jobs etc all everything online um so it's like the vulnerability is sort of built into you know our, our technologies that we're using and you know, I, 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 I mean, is a solution that, well, I mean, you know, that we just deal with it as we go along. I mean, this is what we always do. Um, uh, or is it perhaps to reduce technology dependence, you know, to some extent, you know, is it possible to live a life that's uh, more primitive, so to speak? And, um, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, that, that, that's sort of something that, um, you know, I'm of course having big debates with neoliberal friends about that, right? Who are so uh, progress obsessed. Yeah. What exactly is the right balance? It's something that I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I would phrase it like being more primitive, but like I, I don't, I don't have the answers. I don't know the answers. So at the very beginning of this conversation, and now it seems to be a. Uh, four hour long we're, we're, we're drawing to a close no worries yeah well, <laughs> uh, begin where we end and end where we begin the reason why i'm so interested in trying to develop some type of model some type of framework some type of understanding some type of set of questions so other people can do it to try to understand the broader problem of democracy and trying to maintain democratic health democratic resiliency democratic institutions moving forward is because everything that we've talked about today from changes in the structural relationship of our economy to technological change to even just urban rural stuff straight on down to how we can establish effective deterrence and safeguards internationally how we can preserve our own infrastructure what is the best way for an American to exist in its own country, and whether or not we can find the right balance between internal and external forces of, migra of migration and demographic pressures. Ultimately hinges on what nation we will be and what nation we will become in the future. And I'm a very firm believer, a very passionate believer in the American cultural, the American national, the American democratic project. I, I want to safeguard it, I want to support it, and I want to make sure that similar projects elsewhere also continue to work and continue to thrive in the future. And that's why I'm doing my PhD, ladies and gentlemen. Well, best of luck with that. I mean, uh, I, I read somewhere, you know, like that if you have to choose between being an optimist or being a pessimist, uh, it's always better to be an optimist because, because if you're a pessimist and bad things happen then you screwed yourself twice right um yeah uh, so um at least the optimist you know uh has uh something to look forward to okay on, on that note dennis so best of luck on your phd and uh your thank you next uh, endeavor and um uh, thank you also for being on the on the, on the podcast thank you mm -hmm.